Great, OK, well, I'm going to get started. It's uh, one o'clock and um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this virtual meeting measuring climate change. Uh, I'm Professor Liz Bentley and I'm Chief Executive at the Royal Meteorological Society and I'm here really just to give a, a brief welcome before I hand over to our chair for the afternoon. So this uh, Royal Met Society event is held jointly with the Meteorological Observation System Special Interest Group of the Royal Meteorological Society. And we were hoping to host this meeting about a year ago, actually, uh, but obviously the COVID pandemic meant we had to postpone and uh, we're now running this event virtually. Uh, we've got an excellent set of speakers this afternoon and um, I, I don't really want to delay things too much uh, so we can get on with the programme, but I have a couple of slides I just need to go through. Uh, and the first one really is just around meeting etiquette. So if you can please make sure that your microphones and cameras are switched off. Um, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, so the, uh, the speech bubble that you'll see at the top of the Teams page, uh, you can use the chat to ask questions um, and there is plenty of time for questions and answers. So I would encourage you to uh, put your questions into the chat and, and Mike will get through as many of those questions as he can in, in the time available. If you could indicate which speaker you're addressing the question to, that would also be really helpful. Uh, and then my final slide is just a reminder um, of membership of the Royal Meteorological Society. If you're not already a member, I would encourage you to take a look at the, uh, the website link that's at the bottom of this slide where you can find out more information about the Royal Meteorological Society. There's also information on that website um, regarding the, um, the Meteorological Observations Special Interest Group and, and an opportunity to engage with them as well. So um, an opportunity to find out a little bit more about the society, the special interest groups, and maybe encourage you to become a member if you aren't already. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mike Brettel, who is chairing the meeting this afternoon. Um, I've known Mike for many years. Um, Mike uh, is a, ch a chartered meteorologist and a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society. He's also a treasurer of the Royal Met Society's uh, special interest group on observation systems, as we say, co-hosting this event with us this afternoon. Mike's got a, a wealth of experience in, in meteorological observations. Uh, he originally started his career at the British Antarctic Survey. He worked at the Met Office for a number of years uh, as an instrument scientist. He worked at Vaisala for a while and also at Campbell Scientific. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Mike now, who will take you through this afternoon's uh, meeting. Over to you, Mike. OK, thank you, Liz. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to um, an interesting, an interesting event today. Um, it's um, hopefully we'll get some answers to a very simple, very important question. Um, how exact, how exactly do we know how much uh, climate is changing? Uh, it's a simple question, but um, I'm sure the answers are not as simple as they. Uh, as they might be, but we've got some good people who can no doubt help us through that. Uh, first of all, um, our first speaker, uh, Professor Phil Jones. I'm tempted to say he needs no introduction, um, but he will uh, he, he will get one. Uh, he's research director of the um, Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia, a um, world leading a research institute studying in climate change. He's been there since uh, he's been working there since 1976, and uh, best known, I would say, for his uh, vital work on uh, global uh, temperature series. Um, he has an honorary fellowship of the Royal Meteorological Society, and uh, well, no further ado, um, I think it's uh, over to you, Phil. If you could uh, share your slides with us, please. Okay, thank you, Mike. Hope this is all everyone can hear. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is influences on temperature data and particularly on longer time series, and I'll show some illustrations of that later. So we're going to go through some of the issues about why uh, there are problems making consistent 
what we refer to as homogeneous temperature records through time, such as site change, observation time changes, the way we calculate daily and monthly mean temperatures, something called true mean, and then issues that might be pervasive in many parts of the world, like exposure issues in the 19th century with the introduction of screens, urbanization issues where uh, cities may be where observatories were in the 19th century. And I'll, talk, I'll illustrate this with some long European temperature records. OK, um, so background. What we what we want to have with temperature data is something we refer to as metadata, it's station history about uh, what is known about the site and how things have changed. And we then look at idea at concepts like biases, which might affect more stations than just the individual ones. So these might be due to the exposure, the introduction of screens. Sites may be much more urbanized now than they were, and we're going to talk a bit about homogeneity algorithms. And if all of the stations are similarly affected, then these algorithms aren't going to work, work so well. And um, no site uh, with more than 50 years of data is going to be free of these problems. Um, and just one thing we're going to talk, this is all about the land data. Later, Liz Kent's going to talk about the marine data, which is obviously a bigger part of the world. And But there are really much larger issues with the, some of the uh, homogeneity problems with data from the ocean parts of the world. So why did people start collecting this data? Well, it varies between countries, but often the first observers were doctors, astronomers and scientists who were keen to use the new instruments. But standardization didn't come until the Met services were developed. And this is from about the 1840s, to 1870s in Europe. But throughout this time, climate was always a secondary issue. So even today, our observing network isn't always fit for purpose. The only country which has a network that's really fit for purpose is the, is the US, where they have a network of 114 sites across the country. Um, and they have three uh, automatic weather stations at each site. And I'll show you some results from that a bit later. Um, and WMO, which oversees all the Met services in a way and provides the details of how they should operate. Um, when when things change, they recommend parallel measurements and they've done this for for a long time. Um, but this doesn't always happen. And what always also doesn't often happen, very rarely happens, is that the parallel measurements that they have made haven't always been archived, so we haven't got them. We're trying to search some more of those out, but there's not many of them. The other thing that might be surprise you is that there's no recommendation from WMO as to how daily and monthly temperature means should be calculated. And if one was introduced, it would cause numerous problems. So stations get moved, um, often from city centre sites to airports. And this issue of moving and uh, calculating uh, averages was recognized in the 19th century. In one of my first projects at Crewe in the early 80s, we were going around archives trying to find more data from some parts of the world. And I noticed that in some uh, European books, there were the averages of temperatures taken for about 10 years for every hour. And I, I used to wonder for initially why they did this. And the reason they did this was to enable them to work out out adjustments for temperatures when the observing times changed. I mean, we would do it now with an automatic weather station, but they took 10 years of data so that they could then adjust when the observation times changed. And they could also then look at how the, the introduction of maximum thermometers would um, work. And then they had to obviously go back in time to figure out how the early observers worked when the observing times were sunrise, lunchtime and sunset using solar time. And this was this has been discussed in, a, in the literature from a, for a long time. And from the 1890s to the 1930s, you see a number of papers referring to as the true daily mean. This is 24 measurements every hour each day. And in some countries like the Nordic part of the world, they have developed from these tables of hourly measurements uh, that they took ways of best estimating the 24 hour average from three or four observations. 
So, so when were the best times? But it doesn't really matter what somewhere is doing as long as they don't change it. And so whether they're measuring true mean or the mean and minimum max or a Nordic formula, it, you can use all that data if you're going to use it as, as, as anomalies. The absolute temperatures would be a problem, but if you use it as anomalies, it's very good. What we really want is consistency, and we don't want these things to change. So this consistency we refer to as homogeneity. We just want the temperatures to be measuring the climate, not the issues of how we do the measuring. So more recently, a number of people have developed homogeneity testing algorithms, and I've put some references here to uh, someone, Victor Vanema, who's done benchmarking of these algorithms because they're easy to test. You can set up data where you know all the issues and see if they work. But all, with, with, with all these, it's essential to know the site's history, when things happen, how the environment changed. Now, here's an issue using one of these algorithms, algorithms, algorithms in the USA. So here we have the US Historic Climate Network. It's about 1,200 sites over the 48 US states. And these have data back to the 1890s. And in these diagrams, you've got maximum and minimum temperature. One, in what, maximums in red and minimums on, in the right. And you've, the algorithm is telling you when adjustments are needed for that station to agree with its neighbours. And the histograms are the size of the adjustments. So they centred around zero. And so you get some adjustments which are positive, some adjustments which are negative, and they, they're combining all the, the adjustment values uh, regardless of when they occur in time. The key point though here is that the top one, the top pair of line, pair of uh, plots is the all change points, but the second and third are the undocumented and the documented. So documented is when they know what the cause was. The undocumented is the algorithms telling them something, but um, it, there's nothing in the metadata. So the, the, the key thing here is that you, these all these types of plots have the same sort of shape in that you've got this missing middle, but you really you just can't find adjustments that are very small. But the key point is even in a well uh, run country uh, with lots of metadata and history about the stations, half the adjustments you're finding are not in the documentation. Now, does this make any difference? Well, there's an awful lot of assessment of data in the US. And this shows you a diagram where a group of uh, probably more climate skeptics went round the sites and said, oh, that's a good site, that's a poor site, that's a good site. And so they've set up these 70 good sites, which are the blue line here. From nine, This is the data from 1950 when you average them all together. And on the, the red line is the is all the data having gone through this algorithm. And you can see that the 70 stations uh, are doing very well compared to, and compared to the, all of them, and the algorithms also are doing very well. Um, so this is telling you a couple of things. You shouldn't, um, you can't assess homogeneity by looking at pictures of sites. You need to look at the data and compare with neighbours. It's also telling you that the algorithms work, but it's also telling you that you don't need 1,200 stations to work out the US average. 70 would do, and a smaller number will do. So. We, but we do want lots of stations if we're going to make good gridded products. Now, the algorithms are going to work if um, all the stations are relatively independent of each other and things happen at different times. But um, we know from uh, studies of the um, metadata that there are things like exposure and urbanization, which are, might be similarly affected, uh, similarly affect all the sites like Screens were introduced, uh, Stevenson screens were introduced in Britain in around the 1850s. Um, we had a glacier stand before that, and so we would like to do some comparisons. The initial recommendation in 1725 by the Royal Society and James Durin was that the thermometers should be in an unheated room. I'll show you an example later why that doesn't work. Um, but very, very few of the comparisons that might have been made of these two types of stands haven't uh, survived. And what's been done in Europe, in um, particularly in Spain and also in Austria, 
is to rebuild some of the old screens and take parallel measurements today. And there's a paper recently out in um, IJC with a, one of the longest overlap, or the longest overlap at, at Adelaide between a glacier stand and Stevenson screen over the period from 1887 to 1947. The one thing, if you read that paper, you'll find the glacier stand records temperatures of the too warm during the warm season. So how these early exposure issues have been addressed is by modern parallel comparisons. And occasionally when you've got, um, uh, you've kept the measurements going as in Adelaide in the same way. Now this effect is um, going to be, the impact on uh, from early exposure is going to be in the summer. And it means that with the poor, poorer screens, the temperature is going to be uh, warmer, particularly in the summer months like June, and there's going to be less of an, a small effect in the winter. So it's going to change the sort of seasonal cycle, and that's one simple way of plotting it. Summers are really important because later in the series of talks, Tim Osborne's going to talk about paleo -cre uh, proxy reconstructions, and a lot of that depends on the summers, and we would like to get the summers right in order to do reconstruction. So here's just some examples of uh, uh, some of these differences for the greater Alpine region in Austria and the uh, parts of Germany and France and Italy as well, Switzerland. You can see here that the um, temperatures in June and other summer months need to be cooled slightly to agree with uh, the, the readings when the screens were introduced. And the differences are much smaller in, um, in the winter months. And this is this is where you had a uh, most of these readings in this part of the world were done with north wall locations, and you can see the effects of the longer days in summer that the sun has a direct impact on the on the thermometer. Here's some examples in Austria of a a screen that was in use in 1760s. On the right, you have the um, this is a instruments exposed by an open window to the outside and this is still in use today and if I can get my cursor to work the the window is here so it's facing northwest so this is a Benedictine monastery at Krems Munster and the monks used to measure temperatures with similar instruments to today they're still using mercury and glass the only difference now is that this white area around is plastic but it would have been a uh, painted wooden board in the past. And there's the monastery and on the left here we've got the standard Austrian screen here where they've got parallel measurements that you can do these comparisons. Here's another site in this is the instrument a garden or a lawn outside the Dutch Met service in De Bilt near Utrecht and here they have a this pagoda screen, which is in use during the early 20th century there, and they rebuilt it. It's plastic again, but it would have been painted wood before. And here's a screen from the uh, late 19th century. So they're running parallel measurements today for a number of years, and the modern screen is somewhere over here. Now, urbanization influences are another potential problem because many stations may be similarly affected. Um, I'm going to just show you quickly one or two examples, but there's some excellent papers on this by David Parker in the journal Wiley's Climate Change. And we're looking here at issues that affect monthly and annual temperatures. We're not looking at extreme days. We're looking at long term averages. And one way of assessing this issue is to look at whether stations are, uh, are rural and grid those and then combine it with the all stations. But you know in London we have long records and this is uh, an example of real temperatures uh, in absolute degrees. We've got the maximums at the top, the mean at the middle, in the middle and the minimum at the bottom. So the, the lines to look at are the orange one which is St James's Park and the two green ones are Rothamsted northwest of London and Wisley Botanical Gardens and you can see that the trend of temperatures between St James's Park and Rothamsted and Wisley is pretty much the same. There are slight differences between the minimum and the maximum effect, but in terms of the long-term trend from the early 20th century to the present, 
there's no difference between the trend of temperatures at St James's Park than at Wisley or, or Rothamsted. So what this is showing you is that um, uh, is that St James's Park is warmer than it probably should be, and it's because London is there, but it's got warmer much earlier. So if if, if we're using anomalies like we do in all the combinations and gridding, we could use St James's Park because it's not affected by the urbanisation based on the 1961 to 90 period, uh, but it's warmer than it should be. Another example is the from the Berkeley Earth Group. So they analysed, uh, redid all the analysis of um, land based um, um, temperatures in the early 2010s. And here's a paper they did uh, in 2013, where from satellite they determined that each state, whether each station was uh, urban, they had a suburban character as well, and all very rural. And so they gridded the very rural ones, and then used the all. And so you can see a virtually no difference between the uh, land average for the northern and southern hemispheres, can, whether you use rural or all stations. Now in Europe, we got long, we got very long records, and I want to show you a few examples of these. So you're all you're all aware of central England temperatures. There's a long record from Paris and De Bilt, and there are other longer records in northern Europe as well, Berlin, Uppsala, and Stockholm. And I'll be showing you those. There are some long ones in southern Europe, but I'm emphasising the the northern European ones. Um, so the, the, one of the issues is how well should these records agree? And also how well should the seasons follow one another? So on the next series of plots, I've got um, comparisons of the neighbouring ones. And there's a list of references here where you can get all this detail. And the, the knowledge about the Paris record is much better than the, the other two, because everything's been digitised back to the original records and it's also been done recently and that's part of the reason why it's better. There's a lot more explanation about the Dutch record de Bilt in the Le Brian paper in 1947. Um, I'd say more than it's than you can find in Manley's papers. You've got to go into real depth of Manley's papers and you can find a lot more detail about Manley's what Manley did or what we think Manley did if you read some of David Parker's papers in IJC in the 19 uh, 80s and 90s. So here we've got similar smoothing. We're showing anomalies from 1981 to 2010. And we've got the seasons. So winter is the blue line. Spring is red. Summer is the purple and autumn is green. Now they're going to come together for the base period by, by definition. But if you look at uh, how you compare here Paris um, here, the, the, the seasons stay together quite well. If you look at CET, there is some tendency that CET gets warmer in the summer months. So this is a potential uh, exposure problem with the early instruments, potentially. We obviously need to do a lot more work about that. If you do the same thing with De Bilt in the Netherlands, Again, you see there's the seasons are running together. There's variability from period to period between the seasons. The built and CET all have this warmer winters in the around the 1920 period. But again, CET seems to drift to warmer summer temperatures before about 1800. Here's another example. These are two Swedish series, Stockholm and Uppsala. Now these are obviously much closer together than the the uh, British, French, and Dutch ones we've been looking at, and again the colours are the same. Um, and you can see that the summer temperatures here in the purple at Uppsala seem to get quite warm, but they do at Stockholm too. But maybe it's an exposure issue, and they've both got the same problems. I mentioned right at the beginning also about the um, unheated room. Here's the winter temperatures at Uppsala. So they started taking them properly outside in 1740. They must have decided themselves that the temperatures were too warm in winter. And you can see this blue line just goes, oh, sorry, the blue line just goes up and up in the first two or three decades of this series. And it does to some extent in the um, uh, in the 
a spring and autumn series. So by looking at these and then looking at the seasonal differences between summer and winter can tell you a lot about the sort of long term homogeneity of the series. So I think I've got a few minutes left. I wanted to just stress a couple of things. It's the robustness of averages at large scales. So um, I mentioned that for the US that we you could get you could produce a series with 70 stations. And the, what you can also do for the global average and show is that if all you want is the global average, a hundred hundred well spaced stations will be will suffice. You will get rough, roughly the same answer. If you want a gridded product where people are going to look at all the particular um, grid boxes that you've got, you want to use all the data and uh, make that as good as you can throughout the whole period of record. And you can assess all this by comparing sparse and dense networks through time. And this clearly depends on time scale. We're looking at um, monthly time scales. We're talking about temperature. And so this relates to a, a variable called the spatial degrees of freedom. And it tells you how well you should expect these averages to agree and how many stations you need. And just sort of almost in a couple of diagrams in conclusion. This is a comparison plot that Ed Hawkins and I produced in a paper in QJ in 2013. This is taking series produced by Guy Stewart Callender in 1938 and 1961. So what he was doing, he was doing this in his spare time. He was a steam engineer and he worked out an average for the 1938 of about 500 stations around the world. And because he didn't have the Antarctic, he dropped the Arctic out. So it's just 60 south to 60 north. And so we've done the comparison similarly. In 1961, he used slightly more stations and he got the blue line. So he did better in 61 than he did in 38. But he got the general course of temperature change from the late 19th century to the to the mid part of the 20th century. Um, so it also shows you that this small number of stations also works very well, but just produced in this one average. And finally, I wanted to show you one diagram where you can sh also show the how robust this whole thing is by removing some data. So at the top, you've got the global average and at the bottom, you've got Southern Hemisphere average. And in in black is all the data and in red is taking out all the Australian stations. And you can see in the Southern Hemisphere that if you take out all the Australian stations, it doesn't make much difference to anything before until you get back to 1900. So you can removing Australia actually removes about half the data for the Southern Hemisphere because the coverage there is much better than it is in Southern Africa and South America, but it doesn't have much effect. So this whole large scale temperature averages are very robust. This wouldn't be the same for a variable like precipitation. It may not be the same on the daily time scale, but it's amazingly robust. And the, the, the reason this is really important is that if we it, it later in the sessions today, Tim is going to look, look at reconstructing climate before instrumental data. If we needed thousands and thousands of stations to reconstruct the global average, we would need thousands and thousands of proxy series to reconstruct it, but we don't. And the reason it works is that because you've got this limited number of spatial degrees of freedom. So there are my conclusions, and I think I, I'm up with my time, so I'll let you read them and get to get hand back to Mike. Right, well, thank you very much. I uh, feel that was a very interesting, um, pre an interesting presentation, and uh, quite a few things caught uh, caught uh, uh, caught my attention. Uh, some quite surprises there. Um, We've got uh, we've got a question, um, very in, in, a very interesting question uh, from Holly Turner, and she um, raises the issue of several times you referred to comparisons between old designs of screen and um, uh, modern ones, where um, interestingly the old screens have been reconstructed, uh, but in plastic. Uh, so, so she um, asks the question, um, are we sure that um, the material 
doesn't make um, doesn't make a significant difference. Well, they've been doing some comparisons of that in the Netherlands um, because that Pagoda screen, um, and they don't think it does make much of a difference. Um, we haven't published any results there yet. The redesigned screens in Spain are made of wood, uh, painted white, obviously. So they've they, they rebuilt a, a French Monsuri stand, which was used in before about 1910 in much of Spain. And then they've compared that with the, with the modern Spanish screen. Okay. So it's, it's a good question, but I don't, we don't think it's that, in, it's, it, it's that important. But obviously you've got this comparisons have been made today between what a Stevenson screen would produce and what the automatic instruments would produce that many sites now have. Mm, indeed, I, th I think we'll probably come to that in uh, in, in um, later presentations. Um, it's a very, very important issue, obviously. Um, a, a question, just a, well, maybe more of a clarification. Uh, I'm, I was surprised and and um, surprised, impressed, and well pleased that what seemed to be to me to be so few stations um, in a large area. I think you mentioned 70 in the United States. Um, gives good good reliable results and you mentioned that these sites must be well spaced um can you clarify what you mean by well spaced do you mean um literally well spaced or are you looking for representative make sure you've got some in the mountains and some in the coast and so on and so forth it, it, it's more like getting them um uh, some in the some on the coast some in mountains but just in a way equally spread so you also got to bear in mind but you're not selecting them at random either because you're selecting ones that you know have long records as well. Okay. Because you don't want to have just short stations that in part of your hundred, you want to have long stations that go back as well. Okay, thanks. That's in interesting. Obviously, uh, quite a lot to uh, it's quite a lot to think about. Um, and just quickly, we've got a question from Richard Griffith and um, uh, Richard, I suspect this is something that might be mentioned in subsequent um, in subsequent presentations. Uh, Richard asks, has there been a noticeable change in temperature records since the introduction of modern AWS sensors versus uh, mercury thermometers? I was hoping that um, Stephen would discuss that in the next talk because they have automated the, the measuring at Oxford. I, when, I wonder whether he's got any um, comparisons yet. I mean, one of the issues that's found when, the, when it was first done in the United States was that with automated instruments with a platinum resistance thermometer, you can obviously get readings every few seconds. And so you can pick out the maximum minimum that you might have traditionally done. And so, but what's, what they then had to realise was that that produced too many extremes. And you've got to actually then average a few values over a period of time of a few, a few minutes to mimic what a mercury and glass thermometer would have done. So you've got to get a try and sample your automated instrument in the same way with the same sort of response time that a mercury and glass thermometer would have had or does. Have. It, interesting. Quite a, uh, yes, it's quite a big. This is quite a big issue, which you know, I'm sure we will. Um, you know, we will. Yeah. Uh, meet later. Okay. I can also see the questions too. I, I just went up from Tim Mitchell. I saw that there, there is a repository being put together by uh, Victor Vanema, who I mentioned doing the homogeneity algorithms, and Peter Thorne. So if you contact one of them, you should be able to find what they've got. And I'm afraid it's not that much. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, well, thank you, thank you very much, Phil. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. I've certainly learnt. Um, I've certainly learned a lot to already. Um, first, I'll move on now to our next our next speaker. Um, our next speaker, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Burt, uh, long-standing fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society, 40 years, no less. Uh, innumerable papers, articles, books to his credit. Uh, and uh, he is also uh, a stalwart of the Special Interest Group, which is the um, uh, co-organizer of this of this of this event um, has a particular interest in um, instrument changes and 
uh, weather extremes, which uh, I think makes him ideally qualified to um, uh, tell us about changes in instrumentation and uh, effects on long-term uh, records. So, Stephen, uh, please uh, you share, share your presentation with us. OK, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm having a little bit of difficulty in finding the the, the shared presentation. Um, just bear with me a minute. It was there when I set it up just before we started. Tell me if and when you can see the the slides. Yes, we've got them now, Stephen. OK, good. OK, now it looks as though I've got presenter view. Have you got, can you see just the slide or can you see the notes? Uh, no, I, I can see neither now. It's um, uh, it's dropped off. It's uh, asking to re asking you to reload. Okay. Well, it's showing on my screen. So, ah, the wonder of technology. Hi, oh, Stephen. We can see uh, we can see your screen and no notes. I can anyway. Okay, well, I was rather hoping you'd see the screen rather than the notes, but... Uh, yeah, we, we can't see the notes. You can't see the notes? No. Okay, that's fine. That's the way it should be then. Okay, um, sorry for the slight uh, hiccup. Let's um, let's crack on. So, um, following on from what Phil said, where he's talking about um, sites with changes, um, I'm going to talk about two sites with long records, um, a tale of two observatories, if you like, uh, within the UK, two observatories that I've spent most of the last five years or so uh, working on. So let me move forward. So the first one on the first slide, the opening slide was the Radcliffe Observatory at Oxford, um, now known as the Radcliffe Meteorological Station. Uh, the second slide, which I hope you can now see, is the observatory at Durham uh, in northeast England, and this was photographed taken just a couple of months ago. So for those who don't know uh, where the uh, two stations are, here's a map. Um, the Oxford Observatory uh, began records in 1772 and Durham began records in 1843, and they are the two longest single site records uh, within within England. So here's the first page of the uh, Oxford records, uh, the modern series from January 1811. Um, there's a few breaks in the records up to November 19, uh, 1813, but then we have a continuous record to uh, today. And you can see we have three or four observations per day. We have readings of the barometer, uh, external temperature, internal temperature, wind direction, uh, rainfall and a word or two on the uh, the character of the weather on that day. And similarly for the Durham record, this is the first page of the uh, the surviving uh, earliest observation register from July 1843. Um, we know there were some observations done in 1841, but we haven't. Um, the, the observation record doesn't seem to have survived. So similarly, we've got observations of uh, barometric pressure, uh, internal temperature, interestingly in degrees Celsius, uh, external temperature, maximum, minimum, wind direction, uh, wind speed, rainfall, and again, a word or two on the character of the weather. So to, to make sense of these observations over time, um, as Phil says, the metadata is, is really important and a consideration of the metrology of the, um, the instruments as well. So first and foremost, of course, we need to have some idea of the, of the instruments in youth. Both um, observatories were astronomical observatories. Um, meteorological observations were, if you like, a secondary purpose to the astronomical observations. Um, but generally they had first class uh, instruments from the well known instrument makers of the day and that included the meteorological instruments as well as the astronomical 
instruments. So in most cases, uh, we have some reasonable idea of what the instruments were uh, in, in terms of type um, and who they were made by. So we don't generally have much idea about calibration or traceability of calibration, things that would be very important today. Um, but there were um, calibration tests done, for instance, in melting snow, they generally checked the um, 32 Fahrenheit was the correct uh, temperature. But in terms of um, accuracy and reliability over time, the early instruments were obviously less reliable than, than modern instruments, and one needs to be aware of um, the drift of accuracy with time. Then, of course, there's the site and the exposure. By the site, I mean the physical location of the instruments. By the exposure, I mean how those instruments were, um, well, exposed. Um, so for temperature, for instance, um, were they exposed on a north wall, as in the early records of both observatories? Uh, when were they put into a, a thermometer screen? What type of thermometer screen and changes in um, thermometer screen over time? Um, precision and units, the precision of the observations and the units used are very important. Many of the early temperature records are made to the nearest one degree Fahrenheit, which is about half a degree C, um, which generally doesn't make that much difference in terms of long term means, but it can make a difference if you're looking at um, extremes or um, short period values, for instance. The units are also important and sometimes not obvious. I think generally people tend to assume that the people reading these observations 150 years later would know what the units were. It's pretty easy to work out which are Celsius and which are Fahrenheit, but it's less obvious to work out wind speeds which are in knots or miles per hour, for instance. If you've got wind speeds that are numerical values, is it a Beaufort speed or is it some kind of local scale? Um, that's sometimes not obvious and not necessarily written down either. Um, then there's the observers themselves and the um, observing hours and so on. And Phil's referred to um, some of the um, importance of the, the terminal hours, knowing which period the maximum, minimum total rainfall refer to. Is it 24 hours ended at 9 a.m.? Is it 24 hours ended at midnight? Um, over a long period from the point of view of monthly and annual totals, it probably doesn't make that much difference. But if you're comparing individual rainfall days, it does make a difference whether it's measured at nine o'clock in the morning or midnight. And then there's the observers. Let's just say some were better than others and probably uh, move swiftly on. And of course, there's changes over time as well. Um, as Phil says, anything more than about 50 years time, there will be changes, whether it's changes in the thermometer screen, exposures of rain gauge or whatever. And changes over time can be quite difficult to track down in terms of metadata because it may not necessarily be, be documented. Um, there's a useful document on um, looking at um, metadata for climate in uh, the reference that, that appears up on the screen as well. Now for the Oxford site, um, because it is one of the most important um, and beautiful architectural buildings in Oxford, there's a lot of documentation um, on the, the site and changes in the site from um, prints from the early 19th century uh, through to photographs, um, the history of the building itself. Um, most usefully, the site uh, published its results uh, annually or published annual results from 1853 to 1935 and these include a lot of information on metadata, changes in instruments, instruments exposure and so on and an absolute godsend for those of us looking for, um, for details. Sometimes those were assumed, uh, the map in the middle here for instance is the 1876 Orden survey map um, and from that we could actually see the location of the thermometer screen, which is just a little bit to the north of the western wing of the observatory, which wasn't actually stated in the uh, in, in the metadata. So for Oxford, we have a, a pretty good metadata record, probably one of the best in the in the country, if not the best. For Durham, we have less, um, but in many ways, this is more typical of the metadata available on the site. Um, the observatory was built in 1840 um, and the records are maintained from then. Gordon Manley um, took over as um, the first professor of geography at Durham University in 1929 and um, began to um, look in detail at the Durham record. And many of the early analyses we have are based on, um, on his work. 
The main source of metadata that we have for Durham is the Met Office site inspection reports, which uh, we have from 1902. And these detail the um, the instruments used, they give plans of the site. Uh, later on, they have photographs uh, and they have been very useful in identifying some of the um, uh, changes of instrument over time. So let's have a quick look at uh, some of the individual elements. So we start off with air temperature. Um, so for Oxford, the records, uh, continuous records began November 1813. And you can see on here the uh, various different uh, types of exposure that were used, North Wall up to 1849, and then in a variety of uh, thermometer screens since then, including in 2012, the replacement with a plastic uh, thermometer screen. Now, recently, um, it was referred to in one of the questions to uh, the Phil's talk, the um, mercury in glass thermometers uh, were replaced by an electronic logger um, in October 2017 without any overlap with the existing instruments. And uh, I was pretty annoyed about this, as was Oxford University as well. Um, so we have managed to get a mercury maximum thermometer reinstated, and that's now being run alongside the logger. Uh, there are differences and we are currently trying to work out which ones are the individual logger and which are generic to, um, to, to logging. But there are differences and they will need to be adjusted in terms of the, the long period record. Um, but Durham, the same sort of thing. Uh, North Walls started uh, the exposure. There was a um, uh, what they called a north shed, which was a ventilated wooden shed um, built on the north side of the observatory. Uh, in 1851. Uh, that turned into a glacier stand uh, in 1860. Not the best exposure, as we've already heard, um, but it is the only record that we have for Durham for 40 years up to um, the end of 1899 when a Stevenson screen was installed. The major change in the Durham um, series has been the cessation of manual records in October 1899, uh, 1999, replaced by an automatic weather station, um, which has some advantages and some disadvantages. There have been periods where we've lost quite a lot of data from the um, from the site in 2018, for instance, we lost about 50 days data uh, because of problems with the automatic weather station and the um, telecommunications from it. Um, so an AWS isn't necessarily the perfect uh, perfect solution. So looking at the, the temperature record, this is from Durham um, and the red line is the mean daily temperature range from the Stevenson screen uh, beginning in 1900. And uh, the line before that, the grey line is the mean daily temperature range from the glacier screen. As we've already heard, the glacier screen was uh, likely to warm up too much in sunshine, particularly during the summer months. And you can see that the mean daily temperature range is considerably higher. Uh, the blue line shows the north north shed uh, exposure, which not surprisingly had a lower uh, mean daily range, higher mins and, and lower lower maxima. So we really had two choices. We either didn't use any data before 1900, which would be a shame, um, or we tried to work out a way that we could homogenize the 1860 to 1900 observations to be more or less representative of a Stevenson screen. So I won't bore you with the details, but we did a lot of um, regression work based on previous comparisons with the glacier versus Stevenson um, and use some information that Manley had provided, some of which was unpublished, uh, to try to get a correct series of maximum and minimum temperatures. We did the regression on those separately and from there derived the daily range rather than trying to get the daily range to fit um, on its own, as it were. And from that, um, we could produce a series that actually fitted much better, in fact, better than we'd expected. So this is effectively independently derived and you can see it provides a very good fit um, to the overall series. It doesn't necessarily mean it's correct and certainly not on a daily basis, um, but it, it does at least enable us to, to get some measure of the um, 19th century data from Durham, which otherwise we would have had to throw away. Uh, in terms of precipitation, doing the same thing. Uh, the, the precipitation record at Oxford starts in 1772. Originally, the gauge was mounted on the um, 
terrace of the observatory at about seven meters above ground level and it was subject to wind effects and was a little low um, but it's moved to ground level or, or close to ground level in 1850 and most usefully the original gauge from the terrace was reinstalled at uh, in the North Lawn exposure between 1923 and 30 and uh, run against the current standard gauge um, and that gave us a good idea of how to correct the um, the earlier record. So a very good example of an uh, overlap record there. Uh, for Durham, the picture is more complicated. I won't go through each of these, but um, there was a variety of different gauges in use up to about 1867, some of which were clearly um, better than others, shall we say. Um, but since um, 1867, there's a better rainfall record. And since 1906, it's pretty much the um, standard that we would use today. Um, again, the, the AWS introduction in late 1999 meant the change from a manual um, system to a tipping bucket. Um, and there are some um, potential issues with that, as I will um, show in just a moment. Here's the um, Durham annual precipitation as a percentage of the Met Office County Durham Regional Series, which goes back to 1862, which gives a, um, a useful um, benchmark figure, if you like, from a variety of different sites um, across Durham. The county geography varies a lot from high hills in the Pennines in the west to coastline, the east coast, um, east of Durham. So Durham, as you would expect to be somewhere in between, and it averages about 75% of the, um, the county Durham series. But you can see if you look at the years before 1868, um, there's some very large excursions well outside the climatological range. Um, and with reluctance, um, we had to say that we, we just couldn't trust the record before 1868. So the record is there, but we, we wouldn't put too much credence uh, on that, unfortunately. Now, I mentioned the um, installation of the automatic weather station. Um, it does seem to have an effect in terms of increasing the number of rain days, which is slightly, slightly puzzling. So what I'm showing here is the average uh, precipitation in millimetres per rain day from Durham together with two local sites, uh, one to the east and one to the uh, northwest of the site. And the Durham figure is the green. And you can see the, the quite a difference in the um, in the line before and after the installation of the um, automatic weather station. And this is shown in the um, in the averages as well. The um, site at Esh, which is a little bit wetter than Durham, the number of rain days between 1990 and 1999 and the 20 years from 2000 um, increased by about 5%, which is about what other stations in the area have, have noted. But at Durham, it increased by 15%. Um, and you can see this this began at the installation of the AWS. So I, I think there is a homogeneity issue there, at least in terms of number of rain days, although the total amounts seem to be plausible. But that's something that um, that we're looking at with the, uh, the Met Office. Uh, in terms of sunshine, fortunately, the, the, the situation is a little bit clearer. Both sites, the instrument used was the same and the exposure was, was pretty much the same. Um, interestingly, at both sites, the original recorder was used for about 100 years. Um, so there's value for money for uh, an instrument. But in um, 1999, when the site at Durham was automated, um, a pyranometer was, um, was installed uh, this is also a very shaded exposure at Durham, and unfortunately, the sunshine records uh, are just not compatible with the earlier uh, Campbell Stokes record. So, we now for Durham we use um, a figure based upon the regional series rather than observations at the site, which is a pity. Um, but at the moment, there's no way of of restoring uh, restoring that that series. Uh, in terms of barometric pressure, um, the last element I will look at, um, in many ways, this is even simpler because um, at Oxford, the record began in January 1811, as we've seen, um, a barometer by the well-known manufacturer, uh, John Bird, that was replaced by a Newman standard barometer, serial number 1220 in June 1838, and that is still going. At the moment, it's actually a way for recalibration, but it will reinstall back in the observatory next month. So um, that's been pretty much the same instrument uh, all the way through, although it's only been 0900 observations since 1925. 
Uh, Durham, the same sort of thing. Barometers, mercury barometers tend to be quite expensive and valuable items. So um, fortunately, they don't tend to be changed very often. And the fact that they're in, installed indoors obviously makes it easier to um, maintain that record. So at Durham, we've recently discovered a digitized record, uh, two observations per day, almost 120 years up to 1960. Um, and that is just about to be published. I have a paper in uh, Geoscience Data Journal which uh, which publishes that. That is by far the longest barometric pressure series record for Northern England. Now, when I was looking at that series, um, because there's very few other records to compare it with, uh, I did a underpinning quality control analysis, if you like, against the reanalysis, the 20th century version three reanalysis, the nearest grid point from that. The green line shows the mean error against that. Um, the grid point is slightly north of Durham, so you would expect Durham to be slightly higher than the grid point, which is what the green line shows. And the orange line shows the mean root mean square error. Um, and all looks very good. You'd expect the errors to be larger in the early years because the reanalysis has fewer points to um, to build the reanalysis on. Um, but then there's this peculiar jump around the First World War. And of course, I assumed it was an artifact of the Durham record. Um, they were short of staff in 1917 with so many young men going off to um, to the military service and so on. Um, racked my brains, went through all the records, couldn't see anything that looked wrong. Um, but eventually, to cut a long story short, we found that there is something wrong in the reanalysis data, uh, particularly in the area north of Scotland. And it appears to be some of the due to some of the ship's data from possibly dodgy aneroid barometers being used on military ships um, during the, the First World War. So that's still something under investigation. Um, but it does rather look as if it's the the Durham data that's correct rather than the, um, the reanalysis. So there's a little bit of uh, more work to be done on that. So um, my summary and conclusions, uh, the first thing I would say is a favourite phrase of Voltaire, which is the perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, sometimes it's better to have something than nothing, even if it's not perfect. If we want a record of temperature in Durham in back to the 1850s, 1860s, uh, we have to accept that the records that we've got, while they're not perfect, they are indicative of the conditions of the time, and we can make some statistical allowance uh, for those. Again, may not be perfect, but uh, if you want perfect data, you're probably only really going to use uh, the last 50 years or so. We've seen that the metadata, in, including the metrology of the instruments themselves, is really essential to both qualify and quantify the uncertainties and homogeneities in the record. You cannot do it unless you have some um, reasonable idea of, um, of how the record is, is made up. And I've said things change over time. A good record can for a while become a poor record, uh, come back to a good record with better instruments or more enthusiastic observers or whatever but things do change over time. For both the Durham and the Oxford series, um, we regarded it as important to publish both the raw data, the original record from the registers and any adjustments that we've made to it, uh, retaining the original, the original units. It's much easier to see if a barometric pressure reading in inches is wrong if you have the original reading in inches and you can see it should be 29 point something instead of 30 point something, which may not be obvious if you convert it to millibars. Any assumptions, corrections, whatever you make, um, it's very important that you document those um, because somebody may come up with a better um, way of doing it in future. So document all of those and uh, we have documented those in the, uh, the book that we've written about Oxford and the one that's uh, in preparation about, uh, about Durham. And finally, I would say that Things do change. Um, both sites would benefit from additional equipment to safeguard the record. Uh, we're looking at getting an automatic weather station at Oxford, not to replace the manual observations, um, but simply to provide a bit of cover in case somebody breaks the thermometer or can't get there because of snow or lockdown or whatever. Uh, and at Durham, the site is becoming overgrown with trees. Um, and we do need to try to make sure that we maintain the, uh, the quality of the records by keeping the um, site cut back. Um, 
And that's it for me. Just a few acknowledgements. My co-author on the books, Tim Burt from University of Durham, uh, Met Office Library and Archive for access to those inspection reports, which are absolutely invaluable, um, and to both Oxford and Durham universities for access to their um, libraries. Uh, a couple of references, pardon the immodesty in self-citing the Oxford and Durham books, but um, I think that's easier than listing dozens of references for each uh, for each site. All the information about those sites um, is in is in the books and that's um that's all i have to say thank you for listening well and thank you Stephen, for a good uh, i mean very interest interesting presentation and you finished perfectly on time so um yeah we have some questions for you um the first one from from mark dutton he asks about um rainfall records at durham um he asks did they increase by 15 percent um when uh, the rain gauge was changed to an aerodynam sorry, start again, aerodynamically shaped rain gauge. Um, that would be one by EML, wouldn't it, Mark? I think um, no. There's 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 evidence of a increase in precipitation since the AWS, but there is increase evidence of an increase in precipitation over northeast England since 1999, 2000. Quite a substantial one, actually. The averages for uh, 1981 to 2010 and 1991 to 2020, even though there's only a 10 year difference between the two, um, are 10 or 15 percent higher. But that's not just due to the, the, the rain gauge. Um, as I've shown on one of the plots, that the rain gauge seems to have an effect on rain days rather than rain amounts. Um, so I'm, I'm still scratching my head slightly on that. I would expect a tipping bucket, if anything, would record slightly less rain days. Um, but the simple answer to your question is, Mark, no, we, we, we haven't really seen that. Um, that may be partly because the site is quite sheltered by trees. If it was an open windswept site, more suitable to an aerodynamic gauge, um, the, the effect might be more obvious. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have a question, well, a question and a sort of a comment, really. Um, you've given us a very thorough analysis. You've made a very thorough an analysis of two uh, what am I call flagship sites at um, Oxford and Durham, um, but there are obviously there are many many other sites um, in the U in the UK which are um, obviously very important. They um, get incorporated into the um, Central England temperature record. Um, do, do you feel there's a danger that maybe they um, well they presumably don't meet the standards of uh, Durham and um, Durham and Oxford? Um, is there a is there a is, is there a is there a is there a problem problem there? And there's there's a couple of things I can say to that, Mike. Um, on the one hand, the sites that are at Oxford, but particularly at Oxford, but Durham to a certain extent, would not necessarily be accepted as good sites today if we were looking for a. A, a good long term reference site. But the fact is, of course, measurements have been made there for 180 or 200 years, um, and it's important that we continue those. Now, I don't think anybody would, would disagree with that. Um, but modern or more recent sites um, probably have better exposure. Um, but it's, it's a balance because as I say, some of them have a long period record, which is the important thing, and trying to continue that record, uh, and others have a, perhaps a better exposure. Ideally, of course, what you'd like is a perfect site with 200 years record, with nothing around it that's ever changed, no urbanisation effect, no changes in instrument, um, but they don't exist. So one has to be pragmatic, I think, with um, with one's choice of, of stations. Um, but there are, we, we are blessed with a a good number of long records um, in in the UK, and um, I, I hope that we can continue those records. Stations do occasionally close for whatever reason, um, and that's a great shame if they've got 80, 100 years of record. Um, we just have to try and keep the, the good ones open. Yeah, indeed. I guess that um, records that long from one observatory are um, that they're gold dust, really. In uh... definitely. These kind of um, a few more questions coming on. We can we can overrun a wee bit here. We're just running into our comfort break. Um, Max 
Baron asks, um, I think this is related to changes in um, rainfall days. Um, could it relate to how snow is treated um, by a human, 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 start again, a human observer and an AWS? Um, possibly. Um, particularly at Durham, which of course is going to get more snow than, um, than, than Oxford. But again, if anything, I would expect a tipping bucket to record less rain days or snow days, simply because the snow might sit in the funnel for a couple of days until the temperature rises and it, and it melts. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't think that's a major effect, certainly not in the last 30 years. Now, if we're looking at rain days from Oxford from um, 200 years ago, I think that's definitely the case. There's a, there's quite a number of days in the winter when snow is mentioned in the the weather notes, even if it's only one one word, and there's no precipitation shown. Now, of course, that may just have been a few flakes, um, but certainly Oxford's rain days before about 1860 um, look to be on the thin side, and some of that is probably um, snow not being recorded. But more recently, and in comparison with the the Durham um 1999 increase i it, it's it's probably less important than um instrument changes i think mm, thank you interesting um maybe just quickly one one last question uh mike molyneux asks about trees trees are interesting at, at what point do they become something to be managed um what i think the, the point here is what at what point is the decision made these trees are becoming an issue and um, how is that done? Um, well, Mike, the um, Met Office inspectors um, do a uh, an analysis by 10 degree sectors of the uh, exposure around the rain gauge rather than the screen, but um, it amounts to the to the, the same thing. Um, and when it starts to affect the rain gauge um, is probably well it's too late they need to be be cut back before then but while um trees to the north of a thermometer screen may not make that much difference um trees to the south of course can cut off sunshine and cut summer maxima and therefore drop mean temperatures and so on um when is the effect obvious it, it's not going to be a, a step change it's going to be a gradual change and that's what can make it really really difficult to try and work out the effect on the um on the record but it is something that needs to be watched and it can get to the point where the site can become um, unrepresentative of the site, uh, unrepresentative of the locality. And that's something that we are starting to get a little bit worried about the Durham site. If you compare the photographs uh, taken this year, last year, with the photograph taken in the 1950s, for instance, um, the site is much more open in the 1950s. Now, maybe that made the rainfall exposure not as good but being too overexposed but it's like everything else <laughs> i've said a couple of times it's a compromise it's a it's a balance between getting things right um a certain amount of shelter is a good thing too much is a bad thing too little is a bad thing okay interesting okay well thank you for that we've um we now have a, a comfort break of half an hour and um uh we will reconvene at 14 35 so Thank you very much. Oh, one last quick point on people um, people asking questions. Uh, we will be able to pass these questions on to the speakers afterwards. So if you've um, asked a question and there hasn't been time for me to pass it on to the speaker, it will it will get to them and um, hopefully with your um, they, they will be able to um, reply by one one way or another. OK, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're starting our first presentation this afternoon from uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kent. Um, Elizabeth Kent, she is a researcher at the National Oceanographic, oh, I beg your pardon, Oceanography Centre, uh, where she specialises in air sea interaction and marine climatology. Uh, she's an expert in the field of air sea intera interaction and uh, in 2013 was awarded the Royal Meteorological Society. Adrian Gill Prize for work in this field and she's going to talk to us about sea surface temperatures and marine air temperatures. Um, I hope everybody can uh, uh, can see the presentation. So hopefully that's a uh, full screen. <laughs> 
thank you. Uh, I'm going to move things over the ocean now, talking about sea surface temperatures and marine air temperatures. Uh, uh, but you'll see that we do worry about quite a lot of the same things as you will have heard in the previous two talks. Uh, and I'd like to draw your attention to the, the people whose uh, work I'm going to present today. Oh, sorry, I'm... Uh, oh. right. uh, so global surface temperatures, if you'd have been looking for global surface air temperatures in the 1980s, there's a good chance you would have been looking at, at land data only. And as, as Phil said, you can get good averages, but that's on the assumption that the air, that the, uh, the sea and the uh, land are doing exactly the same thing. Uh, the reason for this was that there were some issues with the um, marine data. There was a lot of work on this in the 1980s in particular, and by 1990, which was the time of the first intergovernmental panel on climate change, first assessment report, there were two um, estimates of the adjustments required. Uh, one was by the Met Office and MIT, and that was uh, published in the GOSTA Atlas, and that forms the core of the adjustments that are provided uh, uh, are still with the, um, the Hadley Centre adjustments that are used today, at least for the early observations. And the other was by uh, UEA, uh, the Climatic Research Unit. Um, so what did these look like? This is a figure from the um, first IPCC report. And there are four lines here. One is land air temperature, one is marine air temperature, and the two different estimates of sea surface temperature. So you can see here the, um, the recent warming is only really just starting to emerge. And we see some quite substantial differences between the time series. So this is after the adjustments have been applied. So what do those adjustments look like? So this is from jumping forward to the fifth IPCC assessment report. All of these data sets have now been modernized, but this is a nice illustration of the sort of size of the adjustments that are applied uh, to this early data. So we're looking at um, global averages of a couple of attempts of a degree. Uh, and as we know uh, from recent uh, you know, current discussions, um, a few tenths of a degree is, is absolutely critical when we're looking at, at global temperatures. So this is the modern picture. This is now looking at global temperatures. So this is combined uh, land and ocean temperatures. So we have land temperature, uh, air temperature over land, combined with sea surface temperature. So now we've got seven different estimates. And this particular figure has been anchored to the average over um, anomalies from the average between 1850 and 1900 to emphasise the the uh, increase since the pre-industrial. Uh, so all of these use sea surface temperature for marine. So even though we've got seven different estimates here, they all, I think, use um, sea surface temperature either from the Met Office or NOAA, uh, although there is also a, a Japanese Kobe um, sea surface temperature, but I don't think it's used any, in any of these global compilations. One thing you can see apart from the improvement in the quality of the, the graphics is that we now have uncertainty estimates for all of these uh, all of these time series, which is uh, which has been a, a tremendous amount of work, but um, absolutely critical to our understanding. So, looking at those sea surface temperatures, uh, as we've heard, we have an evolving observing system uh, over the ocean as 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 over land, but we can see here the early observations. Um, were likely to be taken on a sailing ship uh, and then with the advent of um, steamships and uh, diesel diesel ships uh, both where we get the observations from and the nature of those uh, the biases we might see in those observations will change over time particularly for sea surface temperature less so for air temperature the modern observing system relies on autonomous vehicles uh, uh, autonomous platforms and vehicles um, and most of the sea surface temperature measurements we get in situ these days are from drifting buoys. I've also put on this timeline some of the things, uh, other things that might affect uh, what's going on. We've got the opening of the Suez and the Panama canals, which dramatically changed where we get the data from, and the world wars. So we've got this um, changes in technology, 
uh, civil engineering, conflict, economics, a lot of these are taken by commercial ships. So, you know, depending on the economy, it depends, depends where you get observations. And also, as we know, observations need to be taken with care to be accurate. So looking now at the um, measurement methods on the early for the early data, uh, probably a wooden bucket, uh, moving for convenience to canvas buckets, uh, and that was eventually recognised that they they were um, not really substantial enough to uh, stop the uh, temp the water temperature being affected by the by the atmosphere, and that affected the measurements. We then moved on to um, once ships had engines, they pumped water to cool those engines. So one of we, we started to get measurements of the temperature of the water in the intake. And now we get, as I said, most of our sea surface temperature measurements from drifting buoys. So what does that look like? This, uh, the orange line uh, is, is the estimate of bias from the HAD SST4 uh, the current of the, Had of the Hadley Centre sea surface temperature data sets. And we can see when we start off with the, um, the wooden buckets, we can say that the bias, we can see that the estimated bias is close to zero. It then uh, decreases to a couple of tenths uh, cold when we get these, uh, the data starting to be taken more frequently with the canvas buckets. When we move through World War II, and move to engine intakes, the estimate of the bias is warm. And as we get more dedicated sensors, uh, the, the bias is, is tending back to, estimated bias is tending back to zero. So we can see these, um, these different measurement methods have a, have a strong imp imprint on the, um, the accuracy of the sea surface temperature data. So focusing on the, the canvas buckets, um, this is photos in infrared of a bucket that's been filled with, with warm water. This was about 15 degrees above the ambient temperature. And we can see over 15 minutes, we get a strong reduction in the, um, in the temperature. So we can see that under these admittedly rather extreme conditions, uh, the, the bucket is cooling strongly. Um, and this is this is um, an exaggerated form of, of what we're actually seeing over the ocean. You can also see that the, the bucket is leaking rather, so the, the um, height of the water is uh, reducing somewhat. So what do we what do we do about this? The the Met Office uh, used the Folland and Parker model, and you can see in the bottom right there's a schematic showing that uh, it's a balance a heat balance model of uh, water in a bucket that's cooling by evaporation um, and exchanging heat with the environment and uh, being heated by the sun as well. So we took some buckets, uh, replica buckets into uh, the lab to try and have a look at, uh, at how well the Folland and Parker model worked and the answer was pretty well. Um, we, the, the graphs in the middle show the temperature change uh, in uh, the solid lines are from different runs of the uh, the experiment with uh, different initial water temperatures. And you can see that the pink uh, shows the estimates from the Folland and Parker model. And we can see this is this is a pretty good replication. Obviously, we couldn't do anything about the solar radiation in the lab. But this gave us confidence that this uh, this model was uh, capturing all of the right elements. And that's good because this is uh, this is the model that's underpinning the adjustments that we use. Moving on to look at uh, marine air temperature. So all of the estimates I showed you had used SST, so sea surface temperature as their marine component combined with air temperatures over land. So there are estimates of uh, large scale marine air temperature uh, and the record starts in about 1880, although the the graphs that I've shown here, which are from the recent BAM State of the Climate report, uh, start in 1900. So we can see that we've got two different estimates of um, marine air temperature and also the data from HAD SST4. So the adjustments that are required for marine air temperature are a little bit different. Uh, we have to account for changing measurement heights as ships have got larger. 
um, the apparent temperature. We have a spurious cooling because, um, because of the increasing measurement height, so we have to make an adjustment for that. And there's also some sort of bespoke uh, adjustments that are made when we have unusual observing practices, for example, during wartime. The main difference, though, is that um, we only use nighttime, currently only use nighttime marine air temperature observations known as NMAT. And this is because there are some quite large daytime heating biases. Essentially, the ship heats up and the measure and the um, and the measurement you get is actually of the sort of elevated temperature of the, the local ship environment rather than the ambient temperature. So I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But if you look at these graphs here, you'll see that we do see differences in the large scale averages between marine air temperature and the SST estimates. And we can see that, that had SST 4 in the global mean is slightly warmer uh, than the air temperature estimates. And we can see looking at the lower panel that this actually comes uh, largely from the tropics. So the northern extra tropics, uh, the estimates agree quite well. Uh, but not in the in the tropics. So uh, this is something that, that we're working on and others are too and was highlighted in the uh, most recent IPCC report. But we're, um, we're, we're working to try and understand these differences. So we will really want to adjust for daytime heating biases in marine air temperature. Uh, and the plot on the right, top right, shows why we want to do this. So currently, I said the, the data start in 1880. That's the red dotted line you can see at the top right. Um, and this shows that after about 1880, approximately 50% of the observations are made during daytime. Sorry, during the nighttime, uh, sorry, during the daytime. Uh, but earlier in the record, we can see that, uh, well, first, certainly prior to 1800, most of the observations are actually taken at local noon, which is possibly the worst time. So if we want to extend the record back in time, we're going to have to make use of this, um, of, of, the, of the daytime observations, which means tackling this, um, this bias. We, uh, the lower plot shows the increasing coverage that we would get if we manage to recover these observations. And we can see that actually it will give us an improvement all the way through the record, although particularly, uh, certainly in percentage terms, at the early part of the record. So we want to try and estimate the heating biases present in the observations. The observations come from the International Comprehensive Ocean Atmosphere data set. And we have a, a heating model error that was developed looking at the heat, heat storage, uh, depending on the solar radiation and the other uh, components of the heat budget, similar to the, uh, the bucket model. And what we're aiming to do is to produce a sunrise equivalent air temperature. Um, we'd love to actually get the uh, real diurnal variability uh, retained in the data set, but we really don't have a good enough idea of what, about what that is over the ocean because the, the measurement errors um, dominate. So what do these errors look like? These are uh, the tracks of two ships from the 1880s, the Hazard, which is a, a brigantine. Uh, this isn't a picture of, of that ship, but a contemporary one. And that was operating in the Pacific. And in the Atlantic, we have the Belgian land, which is a uh, hybrid ship, uh, sorry, steam sail ship. So what does the data look like from these ships? So these this shows the difference from local sunrise uh, plotted against hours after sunrise. So we can see that the sailing ship, the Hazard, has you know, a four degree diurnal cycle, whereas the Belgian land that's operating uh, in the, the North Atlantic has uh, about a degree. So we can see a rather strong difference in the diurnal cycles. But we also will see that the, the Hazard is operating uh, further south. So uh, these are all in the summer. So we might expect that uh, the solar radiation effects are greater. Sorry, I should have said that the model uh, takes uh, cloud cover from which we estimate the solar radiation and the relative wind speed over the ship, which acts to, uh, well, moves the uh, air quickly over the ship so it doesn't have time to heat up. So when we fit the model to these ships, these the, the coloured blocks show the, that fit and we can see that we get a pretty good um, estimate of the, um, of the, the shape of the diurnal cycle. Uh, using empirical coefficients that estimate the different components of the heat exchange. So does it 
you know, how much of this is due to the fact that um, they're operating under different conditions and how much is due to the fact that they're, um, they're different ships. And you can see, actually, we've applied the wrong coefficients. So Tom Cropper, who did this work, has swapped over the coefficients. And you can see that the Belgian land has a, a really strong um, heating residual into the, into, into the afternoon post-sunset whereas the hazard heats up really quickly and cools down really quickly. So we can see that that's uh, you know, very different, um, very different things going on with this, um, these two different, two different ships. So um, clearly treating each ship individually uh, is gonna be really important here. So moving on to this, we've already heard about the importance of metadata, uh, describing how the observations were made, uh, and in our case, information about the ships that were used. Uh, why, why do we need to focus on in individual ships? The plot on the left is from Ashford in 1948, who took several different buckets into a wind tunnel. And the, the gradient of the different lines shows the, um, the, the rate of heat loss from the different buckets. So we can see that, that these buckets that were all in use uh, on different types of ships um, so some would be, be similar to the wooden bucket, although they didn't actually test any wooden buckets here, and some would be uh, more similar to the canvas bucket. So we can see that we need to account for a whole range of different sort of thermal capacities of uh, the different uh, buckets. The plot in the middle uh, shows the difference between sea surface temperature um, from measured by a, a range of different ships uh, from a model and we can see differences that vary with recruiting country. Um, each of the horizontal lines shows data from a different country, different methods and also very strongly uh, by ship. And I've just shown you the, uh, the plot showing that we have very different heating characteristics from um, some different types of ships. The problem is, or one of the, the problems is, that many ship reports don't actually have any ID information. So this graph again shows from, from ICOADS, shows the proportion of observations that have IDs. So we can see uh, in the modern, modern record, uh, we've got ID information for most of the ships, uh, but there are periods where we, we really have very little information. This wasn't thought to be important early on. Uh, we just needed the data. We didn't need to know anything. Didn't need to know anything else. And, and as we've, we're learning all the time, the more information we have, the better. So we attempted to do some trajectory, um, looking at the trajectories of, of ships, and we managed to do some tracking. Uh, so the data in a rather lurid pink colour are the additional information that we have uh, gathered about how the data are clustered uh, according to different ships. The yellow. Uh, the yellow observations were resistant to tracking and some of that will be because of the quality of the data and some will be because uh, the tracking isn't perfect. So we've able to associate most of the data uh, with at least, you know, a, a pseudo ID. So we can we can we can look at groups of data if we don't even though we don't know very much about the ship itself. So this is important. This is again going back to it had SST4. And if you they they split the data into data they thought Kate were measurements they thought were made by engine intakes and those they thought were made using buckets. And we can see there's rather large differences between them. So the more accurately we can split data by um, into uh, associate it with a particular ship or platform the easier we can um, associate it with a measurement method. So how do we do this? We don't, sometimes we have a flag telling us, sometimes we don't. And one of the things we've done is looked at the diurnal cycle. So this shows the sea surface temperature, the difference in diurnal cycle is this climatology for a particular um, point, uh, 10 degree box in the North Atlantic. And we can see that under clear and calm conditions, we have rather large um, diurnal cycles up to about uh, 0.8 of a degree, but when it's overcast and uh, uh, overcast and windy uh, in the bottom right, we have uh, almost no diurnal cycle at all. So this gives us an expectation of what we expect our diurnal cycle to look like. How does that compare with what we actually get from the ships? So this is from drifting buoys, and these are measuring near the surface, and they they give us fairly accurate measurements. 
So this shows um, going from 1930, so before 1930, almost all of the observations are from buckets and after 2010, most are from engine intakes. Uh, the ship data, that is, uh, we have a lot of drift data in the modern period. And we can see the sort of brown colour shows the observations where we have a flag to say that it's made with a bucket and orange uh, is a flag to say it's made um, using engine intake. But we've got this white area in the middle where we really don't have any any good information. So what uh, Julia Carella did was compared um, the diurnal cycles we saw in the in the ship data with those we expected based on the drifting buoy data. So the blue line shows the, um, the above the line, uh, the observations showed a smaller than expected uh, diurnal cycle, and these were uh, thought to come from engine intakes. And below the line, uh, they showed a larger than average diurnal cycle measured. This is because we they're measured near the surface and probably affected also by solar radiation. So you can see most of the observations that we didn't, where we don't have any metadata, actually come from engine intakes. And what we'd always done before was assumed that the observations that we didn't know anything about was, were similar to the ones that we, we did, so in, in similar proportions. And we can see that that assumption uh, doesn't really hold up when confronted with the data. So we can see in World War, uh, during World War II, um, so just before about 1945, we can see that we have almost no metadata uh, in the archive and also that the, un the, the blue uh, shading, which shows the uncertainty in the classification, is also rather large. So more recently, uh, Duo Chan looked at adding in an extra diagnostic. So we have, he used, uh, as Julia did, the anomalous journal amplitude, but also added in information about the offset. So rather than using individual ships, he uh, associated the data into different groups by country and the data source um, that are known to have um, or expected to have a um, impact on the data. So do, using this, he was he was able to show that um, a lot of the anomalous warmth we see during World War II uh, can actually be accounted for uh, using um, using the um, using this extra piece of information. So just to summarise, um, we've made huge progress in the last 30 years, and most of this has been drilling down to understand and adjust for the biases in sea surface temperature and marine air temperature. When we started off, there was you know, a large scatter in the data, but over time, we've, um, we've come to understand more about some of the physical causes of that, uh, those differences. And, and we can use, we can then apply adjustments and understand that you know, some of this, some of these differences are real due to, to real variability, and some of them are actually due to um, uh, biases in the observation. We started to use what's what we're calling smart metadata, so diagnosing measurement methods from observations. So this is very strongly linked to this um, physical understanding of why we get these data differences. Um, and we see we've had some some good um, Good results looking at that from uh, look at, trying to work out which observations are made by buckets and which are made by engine intakes. And uh, we've heard this before today, so data management and data rescue should retain as much information about the platforms, methods and environmental conditions as possible. Uh, we're really trying to unpick um, data management, uh, data management issues uh, from, from decades and even centuries past. And, you know, sometimes even modern data rescue efforts, you know, a, a, a struggle to um, find the resources to, to uh, record all the metadata, all the information, um, although that is, that is definitely improving. So uh, I think that's what I wanted to say. So thank you very much. And thank you. That's very interesting. There's um, a lot of very detailed and meticulous work going on. Uh, obviously, in order to uh, you know, but come to terms with sea surface sea surface measurements. Um, regarding the questions, um, one one question came came to me. Um, you mentioned um, not Nmat uh, nighttime um, air temperatures uh, 
being used exclusively. Uh, it occurred to me there's an issue there with um, measurements from particular latitudes and particular times of year. Um, uh, there may well be, well, I mean, there will be, um, there will be occasions when um, nighttime data is in is, is in very short supply. If ships are sailing in um, uh, high latitudes in the summer. Do you, is there a problem there? Do you have to? Um, yes, well, uh, we, we typically high latitudes are rather sparsely sampled anyway. So this is sort of compounding, compounding the, the general issue of um, poor sampling in, in high latitudes. I mean, one of the other issues that we have is a change from uh, reporting at local time and when the observation started being used um, for weather forecasting, there was a shift o over to um, reporting on the synoptic hours. So we, rather than having, so early on in the record, we typically have one observation for every watch. So that's four hours local time. Uh, and then over time, sort of from the 1950s onwards, certainly we're starting to get observations at GMT, which obviously, or UTC, which uh, obviously then gives you different sampling of the downhill cycle around the world. So that's also something that uh, we have to worry about. Oh, interesting, quite um, yeah, di quite, quite difficult. There's a lot of um, yeah, a lot, lot of different, lot of different factors can come around and um, and hit, hit, hit you between the eyes, I suppose, if I can say say that. Um, There's lots of commonality between the sorts of things that are, the people are worrying about for land stations and uh, and and what we're um, struggling with over the ocean. And um, you know, there's, there's a lot of commonality. I guess the issue that we have is that you know, obviously the platforms are moving around, um, which which means the sort of careful station comparisons that are performed over land just just aren't aren't really possible. Mm, indeed. And one other thought, um, pre presumably also, um, your observations tend to be um, focused on the, the, the shipping routes. Um, sort of similar problem that occurs with uh, using measurements from aircraft for, uh, for synoptic purposes. Um, presumably, I mean, is it true you get lots of observations on the main, the great circle routes between uh, major ports and less at um, you know, less yeah. in other parts of the ocean. That's true. I mean, we have things like research vessels that tend to go to exotic places, but not very um, or poorly sampled regions, but not very often. Um, but yes, our, our data are focused on the main shipping routes. Um, we've got a question from John Gould um, asking where we see the significant advances in this area of science coming from. I. I You've you've placed a dichotomy there: data archaeology, so data rescue, or um, or refining biases. Um, I, I think they will go hand in hand. I mean, one thing uh, we're doing in the GLOSAT project, global surface air temperatures, is really trying to focus on on looking at uh, trying to recover observations where we've sort of got these parallel measurements measurements made in two different methods, and and make sure we've got full sampling of the diurnal cycle. I mean, if you, you saw, if you remember the, the plot I showed where we had not very much data, nighttime data during the early period, I mean, observations where we have full sampling of the, the, the diurnal cycle in the early part of the record are, um, are you know, absolutely vital. So I think those things go hand in hand. I've got a question about AI. Um, I think more likely sort of machine learning side of AI is is going to be really important. We're really getting to the point where we can really start to use some quite powerful statistical techniques on this data. I think the move into trying to use a sort of machine learning uh, framework will be fantastically important. But, uh, you know, more data and metadata are, are always going to help help that. Interesting. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Liz, very useful, very interesting presentation. And um, as always, I've uh, I've learned a lot. Oh, maybe we've got one. Would you like to just quickly deal with what um, uh, Alan Vance asks? An interesting question about ships in port. I guess you see that. Yes, um, I'm not quite sure. I'll have to think about that. Um, so maybe we can. Uh... 
we can move on. <laughs> and I'll reply yeah. to that in uh, Let's move on. Thank, thank you very much. Um, our next next presentation, um, quite a quite a change here. Um, we're uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Professor Merchant, uh, Professor of Ocean and Earth Observation at the University of Reading, and also affiliated with the National Centre for Earth Observation. Um, his speciality is measuring surface temperature from satellites and thereby creating uh, global data sets which are um, very very useful for uh, climate research um, and the title of his presentation satellite based climate uh, data records so um chris are you ready to share your um, share your presentation thank you you can you confirm you can see the first slide and hear me and see a laser pointer and uh, now I've still got um, the last slide from um, the last presentation in front of me. I don't know if that's the same for everybody. Maybe Liz needed to stop sharing. Ah, yes, much better. I've um, I've got your presentation um, clearly. Excellent. I'll just get the laser pointer going again. There we are. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to add to the scope of this meeting some comments about uh, measuring climate from from satellites uh, space-based records well you might wonder what we can tell about the climate from space given that these satellites are orbiting above the atmosphere in a vacuum and there are basically four things we can look at uh, we can look at variations in, in gravity uh, we can essentially measure time the, the range from the satellite down to the surface and back um, from an emitted radar pulse. We can look at reflected sunlight. Uh, and there's also the radiation that the Earth em emits itself, so the infrared and microwave radiation emitted by the Earth in virtue of its temperature. And for most of my talk, I'll be talking about a climate data record of sea surface temperature that uses infrared observations extensively. But before we get into that, I thought I would give a, some idea of the range of different climate related variables that it's possible to address with those limited set of observations from space. So probably the largest program for um, creating climate data records from Earth observation data is the European Space Agency's Climate Change Initiative. And it addresses something like well, over 20 variables, which are very useful for unpacking how the climate is behaving. So these range from fire, I'm not going to read all of them, uh, through the ice sheets of Antarctica or Greenland, uh, sea ice or sea level, the amount of snow on the surface or soil moisture. So you can see there's a whole range of variables of real interest that, that can be measured from space. But as Mike mentioned, my particular uh, project, the one, the one I lead within this climate change initiative is on sea surface temperature. Now we've heard from Liz uh, about the importance of uh, the marine environment in, in climate um, and uh, one thing to think about is how a satellite climate record for sea surface temperature might differ from an in situ based record that, that Liz might create. Well, one thing is it's going to be shorter um, but other than that we have to think about these five things. So the space and time distributions of the measurements is different. Um, there are relatively few measuring instruments around about 20 as you'll see. We are, of course, making an indirect measurement because we're viewing the surface through the atmosphere from space, and this is a changing atmosphere. We might also uh, ask how the errors in the measurements behave. Uh, as we've heard, um, this is a really important consideration for all the sorts of records we're talking about today. And the issue of the diurnal cycle also arises in the case of satellite observations. So here is a curve of sea surface temperature anomaly over the last 40 years. And uh, you'll have seen, well, in, in Lizzie's talk, uh, the, the tail end of some of her graphs were the same curve assessed from in situ data. So, so what's different about this uh, record for sea surface temperature anomaly compared to the, the graphs we've seen already in, in, the, in the afternoon? Well, one thing is that this curve, uh, I think uniquely, is not making direct use of in situ measurements at all in its creation. And this is important. We get 
a very similar pattern of climate change in the marine environment over the last 40 years. The, the, the temperature of the sea, according to our record, has been uh, rising at 0 0.15 Kelvin per decade. And you get the same rate of rise from the in situ based records that Liz was talking about earlier. And so this is a really powerful corroboration of this picture of climate change that's happened over the past 40 years, because we have two independent technologies, both assessing global at the global scale, uh, which t essentially tell the same story at the global scale. But one thing that's different is the number of observations going into this curve. Um, now, I've written this as 5 times 10 to the n infrared radiance measurements are used to create this curve. Uh, I'm going to leave you to mull over what you think n might be for a couple of minutes. Uh, a little clue is that um, in this data set, the average density of observations is about 13 for each square kilometre of ocean in, in a given year, which is clearly far higher than would be possible from any in situ system. Now, the upshot of that higher density of observations um, is that uh, we see a, a, a far greater amount of, of spatial detail. Now, this is um, uh, a, a picture of um, sea surface temp temperature, but on a scale that you can see at the right hand side that varies by latitude. And the, the, the purpose here is to enable us to see all the interesting dynamics that the sea surface temperature is, uh, is, is displaying at this high spatial scale. You can see um, equatorial Kelvin along strong contrast of temperatures across uh, the western boundary currents, such as the Gulf Stream. And if you go to the URL at the bottom there, uh, you can see this uh, animated as a movie at a speed of one month a second, and you'll see other things such as the, the advent of hurricane wakes and, and other phenomena uh, occurring over time. So we have an immense spatial detail here. Uh, oh yes, I don't. I am playing the movie now. I don't really know how well that will work for you um, remotely, uh, but hopefully you're seeing some of the of the interesting dynamics. People often assume that uh, these data are from some sort of model, but this is purely observational based. So if it's not playing very well, please go to that picture location and look at the movie for yourself some other time. It looked pretty well, actually. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad about that. Um, in that case, um, let me. <laughs> you've tempted me to play it again now. Oh, it won't play again, unfortunately. OK. Well, we'll move on. And the answer to what, what value is n is 12. So in the curve you saw and in the, the movie that we, we just played, um, it's based on 5,000 billion infrared observations. And processing that sort of quantity of measurements, of course, requires a big computer. And we're very fortunate in the United Kingdom to be able to have access to um, a very large data archive and a, a computer clustering cluster right next door that can see that archive. And this really enables us to do this sort of science. This is um, based up at uh, uh, the Rutherford Appleton lab. Now here's another movie, and this is illustrating the different sampling distribution that we're talking about when we're looking at observation from space. There are two satellites, which I hope you can see, and the sorts of data we're using in our climate data record come from the low Earth orbiting satellite, which you see rotating um, around the Earth, uh, more or less north to south. Now we're looking at the Earth here with the sun behind us, um, a fixed location. And one thing I want you to take away from you is take away from this image is that the way the satellite orbits is such that it observes each part of the surface at the same local time of day because it's the same orientation relative to the sun. Uh, the other thing that you'll note is that um, in the course of a day, the, the, this low Earth orbiting satellite sweeps around about 14 times and gets a series of strips of data from which we can build up a, a more or less global picture in the course of one day. Now, because we see the whole Earth from a system like this, um, of course, we don't have very many at any given time. And uh, in our record, you'll see later that the number of satellites at any given time can vary from, from one up to just a few. The whole list of the, the different platforms we use in our work 
is on the right hand side. And covering this 40 years, um, there is a total of uh, 23 different instruments. So although we have thousands of billions of measurements, uh, they're coming from a relatively small number of instruments, which is very different to um, the in situ situation. Now, how is the sea surface temperature actually measured? Well, the, the radiance we're using to estimate the sea surface temperatures is, if you like, earth shine. It's like all objects, the earth shines with radiation according to its temperature. And uh, at earth like temperatures, that radiation comes out at infrared wavelengths and also microwave wavelengths. The atmosphere is mostly opaque to infrared radiation, partly because of clouds, but also because of other um, radiatively active gases in the atmosphere. And we can see this on the right. This is um, an infrared picture of Earth. And what you notice is that you cannot see the surface. Instead, you see lots of very interesting atmospheric phenomena. But there are windows in the spectrum at which we do have some sensitivity to the surface temperature. So these curves show the amount at which the temperature of the radiation changes if we change the surface temperature by one Kelvin. Uh, so it measures the sensitivity to the, the target variable we're trying to capture, the sea surface temperature. And at these particular wavelengths, we have quite high sensitivities, although it does vary with the state of the atmosphere. And you can see that in the relatively dry mid-latitude atmospheres, we have a greater sensitivity to the surface temperature than in the equatorial regions. But we have a number of wavelengths here, and uh, we can use the differential sensitivity in these different channels to back out the effect of the SST and separate it out from the effect of the atmosphere. And, and that's the basis of the sea surface temperature observations from space. We have to account for water vapor, but that's not the only greenhouse gas we have to, we have to think about because we're looking over a period of 40 years and particularly carbon dioxide has changed significantly uh, in that period. And there is some sensitivity to CO2 and we also account for other trace gases in the atmosphere. So that's the the observational basis on which we infer the sea surface temperature. What the data actually look like is illustrated in this slide. We have a, a low Earth orbiting satellite that, that gathers a strip of information, and that's shown on the left here. You can see it going from Antarctica um, up to North America in this example. There are gaps, and that's where there's cloud in the way, uh, uh, and infrared radiation is stopped by clouds. We have no sensitivity to the surface temperature in, in the cloudy areas. So a full orbit projected onto the, the full globe of the Earth looks like this. And then if we collect all the observations from one satellite during the course of 24 hours, uh, we would get a coverage zone in this plot labeled L3C. And then what we do, um, be, because many users need for their applications some uh, spatially completed form of data, quite a lot of users will use the, the data on the bottom, which is also the data I showed you in the movie earlier on, where we take all the satellite available for that day and spatially interpolate the data. Not in a simplistic way, because um, that wouldn't give a very good result, but we have some, some well-developed techniques with the Met Office for doing this sort of interpolation. So those two slides have summarized an awful lot of um, literature that we've published over the years. And if you're intrigued and want a summary of the whole process and further references, you can look at our scientific data paper um, shown on the right here. If you'd like to get some data in a simple way and, and look at it, look at your favourite part of the ocean and how the temperatures changed over time, for example, um, we have a website, www.surftemp.net, which enables you to order and play subsets or, or time series uh, and down, download subsets or time series um, of the data to play with. Now, let's think about the errors, as has been a major theme in uh, the whole of this uh, afternoon. You might think that our errors would be tiny when we've got 5,000 billion observations, but um, uh, the fact is that we're not dealing with independent errors, as has been a common theme throughout this afternoon. Uh, what we are really worried about are the systematic effects that come in. Um, the plot on the right shows how the contribution to uncertainty varies with different types of uh, error sources. Uh, as a question, uh, as a function of the scale of the data analysis. So it is indeed the, the random and the independent um, errors that are the biggest contribution to uncertainty when we're looking at a small scale and, a, and a basically an instantaneous satellite observation. Uh, 
as we go out to the larger scales and longer times of observation, it's really the biases in individual satellites and the relative biases between satellites in different series, uh, series of satellites ac across the years that, that dominate the uncertainty. And since we want to compare SSTs over decades, uh, this stability question is a real focus. And um, the reason that uh, the, 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 the systematic effects dominate is that is similar to some of the, the, the discussion on the in situ observations. The, the sensors we're using for the last decade are not the same as they were in the 1980s. Um, there have been various uh, evolutions. Although all the sensors are calibrated before they're sent up into space, um, of course, there's some uncertainty in that calibration. They're not identically calibrated. Moreover, as um, satellites fly around, the sensors age, and this can make the biases change slowly over time. So we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, calibration and biases uh, and how to reconcile these between the whole sensor series of sensors that we're using. I don't have time to go into um, all the questions that are raised by these issues, but there is one other issue which I will illustrate in a little bit more detail, and that's the local time of overpass of the satellite. Remember I mentioned when I showed you the satellite movie that um, most observations from a low Earth orbiting um, sensor are happening at roughly the same time of day over time. Well, that's not entirely true um, through the whole lifetime of a satellite, as you'll see in a minute. Now, Liz mentioned that sea surface temperature has a diurnal cycle, and that immediately means there's a danger for trying to construct a long term satellite record if your observation time is changing as it does. Uh, so the black curve here is the mean diurnal cycle as we estimate it for clear sky conditions across the global ocean, and it's almost half a degree in amplitude. And this means that um, we have a signal here that if not treated carefully, um, could end up in it as a false uh, signal in the climate record. That's because satellites don't all ob observe the sea surface at the same time. So this plot on the right shows the local equator crossing time of uh, low Earth orbiting satellites that we're using. And you can see that there's a whole variety of missions that I previously mentioned, uh, and they are observing at different times of day. So we have to uh, avoid aliasing of um, this, this into the diurnal cycle, sort of this diurnal cycle into the long term climate record. Not only that, some of them drift in time during the course of the day, and this has two effects. It, it moves their observation relative to the diurnal cycle but it also changes the environment that the satellite is operating in, which can affect the biases. So in our climate data record, we, we provide the sea surface temperature at the time of observation and also the SST at a standardized local time where we've, we provide an adjustment to 10.30 in the morning, at which time the sea surface temperature is very close to its daily average. And also we choose that time because there are a number of very high quality sensors a series that observe at that sort of time and need a minimal amount of adjustment. Now, the adjustments made by physical modeling, as, as all the retrievals of the SST are made by physical modeling, and that physical model has been validated by the statistical model that you know, was showed in an earlier slide. So the upshot of all this work, of course, is a lot of detailed data, as I've already shown you, and that can be presented in a number of ways. At the top left hand is the long term average sea surface temperature in our, our record. Perhaps more interesting is the climatological annual temperature range in the lower left here, which shows some really interesting spatial variation variability. Um, so this is the, the, the typical difference between the summer peak temperature and, and the winter minimum. And then on the right hand side, there's a little animation of the seasonality of sea surface temperatures over the 40 years. Now, just to uh, conclude the talk, I'd like to make, I'd like to give one example as to why all this um, technical effort is is very much worthwhile. Um, and this is an example of the sorts of use to which uh, a satellite-based climate data record can be specifically put. Um, because we can go to specific locations in, in the world over the last 40 years and, and look at their temperature over time. So I hope you're all familiar with um, the beautiful environments that are coral reefs and the amazing biodiversity that, that exists in, in these habitats. Uh, but you're probably also aware that periods of heat stress like marine heat waves 
can cause corals to bleach, which means that they lose their, their colour and they sometimes can, can thereafter die. Now, corals are very long lived animals and uh, they adapt to their climato the climatological state of the ocean that, in which they are immersed over a period of decades. And so to understand their responses, you need the long term um, temperature information and you need that to be stable and well observed as well as the information about particular events uh, in, in their specific locality um, in recent decades. So this shows uh, an investigation undertaken by William Scurving at Coral Reef Watch, where they tried to understand the, the percentage of corals that bleached in, in some particular events, uh, bleaching events over recent decades, as a, as a function of the peak temperature stress that the corals had experienced. And they, they found when using an older um, SST record that they didn't get a very consistent relationship between the, 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 the corals response and, and the stress under which they were going. But when reanalyzed using um, our more up to date um, SST CCI climate data record, this collapsed those curves into a much more consistent pattern. And this looks like um, we're dealing with a much more reliable basis for understanding this ecosystem response uh, using our data set. So um, the observation of Earth over decades from space does make um, Earth observation highly relevant to climate science. We can't do the 100 year time scale, um, but the processes and level of detail that Earth observations can reveal is extremely important in understanding the contemporary Earth system. Now, we are dealing with billions of observations from historic satellite missions, and the, the same issues of documentation and metadata do arise when we're dealing with the older satellites. And this is um, scientifically and technically demanding and, and resource intensive in terms of computing. But hopefully I've persuaded you that we can nonetheless obtain stable and multi-decadal climate data records that are um, of great value, both in corroborating the in situ based records, but also complementing them um, by being able to look at in great detail over the recent decades. So that's my talk and I'd be happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much. That's a very, inter very interesting presentation and it gives, um, it, well, it certainly gave me a lot of insight into the, the, the precision of um, uh, measurements that are required in uh, um, climate science and the, the efforts that, that have to go into uh, in, into obtaining that. Um, we've got a couple of a couple of good questions uh, for you, Chris, as you can probably see there. Um, Aisling um, asks, are there any areas of the Earth where satellite coverage is consistently lacking because of cloud cover? Well, certainly the, the cloud cover is, is very variable and um, certain seasons and uh, regions, latitudes uh, can have persistent cloud cover for a long time. I didn't talk much about microwave observations. Uh, we can use microwave observations of sea surface temperature, uh, which are able to be sensitive to the surface temperatures, even in the presence of clouds. These are really only available for the last two decades, uh, decades as opposed to four decades. Uh, but we have done experiments where um, we've tested the sensitivity of including or not including uh, those all weather type of observations and at the, at the scales and uh, we're talking about it doesn't make a significant impact on, on the record. OK, thank you. Interesting. And we have a question from uh, Sandra Spillane from Medair. And um, are all the temperature passes averaged before interpolating? Um, and what interpolation methods do you use? Um, IDW or CRIG or something else, which is a um, deeply statistical question, I guess. So we, um, we grid the observations onto the grid that's going to be the final grid for the interpolated data, uh, satellite by satellite. So there's some a small amount of spatial averaging from the one, one kilometer native resolution of the original satellite data up to the 0 0.05 degree grid that we use for the, the gridded data. Um, but that's done individually across satellites. And then the interpolation method is, we, we use the system that 
the Met Office runs for uh, its um, near real time system. We also apply that in the, on the climate record. Uh, and that's uh, an optimal interpolation method. It has a couple of different length scales so that um, where there are large gaps in the data because of extensive cloud fields, um, the anomalies are propagated uh, with appropriate uncertainties um, over that large distance, but also short length scales uh, in the interpolation where which try to preserve all the detail that we see when we do have uh, clear skies or, or scattered observations available. So if, you, if you're interested in that, again, there's a summary in the, the scientific data paper that I, I mentioned. You can read all about it. Thank you. Inter in interesting. And uh, maybe a final question then from uh, Tim Osborne. Um, he asks, what are the issues with estimating surface temperatures over sea ice? Yes, yeah, so um, sea ice is a little bit more challenging than the ocean because the emissivity of the surface is more variable. So we have very good physical models for um, the emissivity of uh, the sea surface as a function of salinity and wave state and, and the various factors that affect it. But um, sea ice it can be covered with snow, it can be uh, under various um, states which make emissivity more variable. And that's, but that's really the only additional source of uncertainty from, uh, from, a, from a point of view of estimating the surface temperature. You have a bit of extra uncertainty because the emissivity is more variable and you can't model it as reliably. Uh, and I do see another question from a former colleague up at Edinburgh, Roy Thompson. Oh, so yes. I must take that because, um, okay. because he's a former colleague, if you don't mind, Mike. Okay. How can marine tipping points be forecast? <laughs> well, I guess that um, in general, yes, the, the fact that we, we see these processes um, in, in detail um, uh, in, in a spatially resolved way that does enable modelers to, to test their, their data in, in a spatially resolved way, um, which hopefully will help them understand whether there are marine tipping points around the corner. Interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very, very useful, very useful presentation. Um, I think now it's time to, to move on to um, uh, Tim Osborne, uh, whose, whose, type, whose presentation is titled uh, Extending the Modern Record Back in Time Using Proxy Data. Uh, Tim is, is a Professor of Climate Science at the University of East Anglia and Director of the UEA uh, Climatic Research Unit. In his work, he's focused on variations in climate and their causes. He works with the uh, Mad Crutey uh, Global Temperature Record, uh, a collaboration between UEA and the Met Office, and he uses tree ring data to identify how the climate has changed before the instrumental period, which I believe is what he's going to um, tell us about um, shortly. So perhaps if you could load your presentation and uh, carry on, please. Thanks, Mike. So I've just tried to load my presentation or share my screen. Has that worked? Uh, yes, I can see it clearly. Yes, that's great. OK, thanks a lot. Um, and as Mike says, we're now kind of moving away or at least partly away from the instrumental data. Uh, so how can we go further back in time using data from climate proxies? So, I mean, paleoclimate is a huge topic, so I can't cover it all. Um, so kind of in keeping with the aims of the meeting, I'm going to focus on how we use instrumental and proxy data together. I'll explain what a climate proxy record is, what its desirable characteristics are, um, and, at, and at what stages we make use of instrumental data as well. Um, as Max says, I'm going to use Turing data as a kind of primary example, uh, but I'll also show some results from networks of different data types uh, that can tell us about climate at the kind of hemispheric or global scales. So I'm actually going to start with the kind of the big picture. So here's the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the IPCC's latest assessment for temperature changes at a global scale um, and during the era of human civilization. So, I mean, how do we know this, what the data used, how do we interpret or calibrate them? Um, and these introduce uncertainties that we need to consider, some of which are shown here by the by the ranges the pale coloured lines. Um, but before I go on to that, sometimes we do get 
a bit bogged down by focusing on issues where the uncertainties might be of the same size as the issue. You know, for example, is the modern warming definitely warming warmer than earlier periods? To answer that, we need to quantify the uncertainties really carefully. Um, but kind of, let's first think about the big picture. So global average climate changes over the recent centuries and millennia have not been very large. So perhaps one degree Celsius. And if we continue on a high emissions pathway, then those past natural variations will be dwarfed by the changes that we have already seen, plus further changes by the end of the century. So uh, this is already a key finding from climate proxies. I think that climate has been relatively stable during the development of human civilization. Um, so even before we get into the uncertainties, you know, even if they were, say, half as big a gain as shown here, and that kind of conclusion of relative stability wouldn't be changed. So I think that's a really important thing to initially think about is what these records have shown us already. Uh, and the fact that we could move into climates that we've not experienced before. Oops, what's happened to my slide? There we go. So what is a climate proxy? Um, so the two things. Uh, first of all, we need an archive that grows or builds up. And then you need things within that archive that we can measure and that tell us something useful about climate. So together, those two things um, is what a climate proxy is. And as an example, tree rings, they build up material over time, um, over the lifespan of a tree, for example. And if the spectators will allow you, you can take a sample, a tree core in this case, without killing the tree. So here we have Jones and Briffer from 1982. Sorry about that, Phil. Uh, and then here inside the tree, we can see the archive and the annual growth rings. We can also precisely date each ring, not just by counting them, but by cross dating against other samples. So multiple samples is the key to get the precise dating. Then what can we measure in the sample? So if we look under the microscope, we can see the annual growth rings more clearly. Uh, and this is a pine tree. They're easier to deal with than the oak trees we just saw in the previous picture. But you can still do it with oak trees, it's just not so clear. Let's zoom in a bit further. So what you should be able to see, I hope, is that the ring uh, is made up of cells and the cells change over the course of the annual growth ring. So the size and the thickness of the cell walls, the size of the cells and the thickness of the cell walls changes over the course of the growing season. And that's why we can easily distinguish each ring visibly. And therefore, we can measure the width of each ring. Um, one tree on its own, of course, won't be useful. You know, its growth could be affected by many other things. But if we sample tens, hundreds, ideally even thousands of trees in a region, then if on aggregate they're all growing poorly or all growing well, in a particular year, then some common foreseen is present and causing that, likely some anomalous, anomalous um, average weather during the growing season. Um, as well as um, ring widths, we can measure other things. We can measure the, um, the colour. We can measure the chemical composition. Um, or indicated here, we can measure the density of the wood with X-rays. And that kind of blue line is a, is a schematic of a density tr trace through this ring. And you can see that the density increases um, towards the end of the growing season, where the cell walls are thicker and the cells are smaller. Um, and we have quite a good understanding in terms of physical processes, that at least for conifers growing in cold conditions, that a warm summer allows the tree to grow much denser wood at the end of the growing season. So the maximum density is quite a good proxy for growing season temperatures in those types of trees. So a quick overview of some of the pros and cons of tree rings. So first, the disadvantages. They're complex biological organisms. They're affected by multiple climatic and also non-climatic influences. So on the face of it, finding a proxy for a single climatic variable like temperature or precipitation is going to be difficult. Uh, next, some advantages. So they have high temporal resolution compared to some other proxies. They can be precisely dated and many samples can be taken. And because they're precisely dated, those multiple samples can be combined and the common signal can be assessed. 
So we can address some of the limitations by making use of these good aspects. So as I said, we can make multiple samples, which can help reduce the uncorrelated errors. Uh, we can take multiple sites and measure multiple variables, and that can help us evaluate the correlated or systematic errors. Um, and especially important is we should sample near the margins of the ecological range. So why is that important? Well, we're going to take a brief journey. If it will allow me to. So we're leaving here the climatic research unit um, on the UEA's campus, which some of you may have seen on BBC One Monday evening. Uh, and we're going to travel to the northeastern corner of the Tibetan plateau. And here it's high and therefore cold, but it's also particularly dry. So annual precipitation around 250 millimetres. So compare that with Norwich, where we've just, where we've just left, at 675 millimetres. So the trees here, you can see, hopefully, these little green dots on the mountainside, these are slow growing, they're long lived. There's an open canopy, so there's less competition between trees, so less competition effects. Um, dead samples tend to be preserved. And the tree growth cares about how much it rains each year because it's so dry. So here we've been working with an excellent group led by Bao Yang. And him and his colleagues have sampled thousands of these Killian juniper trees, um, both dead and alive. So that's the data we've been working with um, for this particular project. Um, so where does the instrumental data come into it? So having collected the data, ideally we already understand the processes that link the local climate to the measured proxy. Um, but despite this, we almost never have a precise theory or a precise model that links climate to our proxy. Even if we do have a model of the proxy system, in you know, a model of tree growth, for example, as a function of light, moisture, nutrients, etc., we also have unknown parameters. So therefore, we use instrumental and proxy data together to build an empirical model. So fundamentally, reconstructing past climate is an empirical activity. Um, I should say that there's a couple of places at least in which instrumental data are used. So on the left is an ideal approach where we already have a very good understanding of the mechanisms involved. So we can go out and develop the records without actually using instrumental data at that point. And we might um, develop a record that we strongly expect to be a good proxy for a target variable such as temperature or precipitation. The instrumental data is then used later on when we calibrate um, the proxy is also used to quantify the errors or test the, the reconstruction. On the right is a slightly less good, although still commonly used approach. You know, we may have an idea about the mechanisms that control a proxy, but when we evaluate the proxy records, we find that some are well correlated with climate and some are not. And the poor ones might then be rejected. So we're using the instrumental data potentially at that first stage of selecting some records, rejecting others, which is not ideal because when we then use it again for the empirical calibration and for the error estimation as well. Quick look at the left hand approach for the trees I mentioned from northeast Tibet. So this is an amazing data set. Um, Bao Yang and his colleagues have sampled more than 12,000 trees. They've measured the width of more than 800,000 individual tree rings from both dead and living material. The blue shading shows um, how many samples per year we have over time. And then the average of all the samples in terms of the um, ring width that's been processed to account for the changes in the age of each ring, the average of all those values in each year gives a chronology of three and a half thousand years of relative tree growth. So this is not a calibrated reconstruction at this point, this is just a record of tree growth. But from our mechanistic, mechanistic understanding, we know that here that tree growth is going to be linked to precipitation. So here comes the empirical and um, instrumental data. Um, so the scatter graph here shows the ring width on the, the y-axis versus the observed precipitation, the annual totals of precipitation on the x-axis. And the correlation between the two is shown at 0.84. And we also use linear regression shown here by these um, different lines of fit to estimate the precipitation from the ring width and then we can apply that to all years in the record. So 
we end up with a reconstruction of past precipitation. This is what we find. The top panel is for each individual year in the last 400 years. If you look closely, you can see in red at the top right the observed instrumental precipitation for the last 50 or so years. And then the bottom panel um, shows the last three and a half thousand years, but with a 50 year smoothing. I'm not going to spend long analysing how rainfalls changed in this record because the topic today is more about how we know this rather than what the changes are. Um, I'll just point out that the greatest relative ring growth occurred in the recent decades. This suggests that the upward trend in observed annual precipitation that we've seen in instrumental data has brought this region into its wettest period for three and a half thousand years. This is on the poleward margin of the East Asian monsoon. It might be an indication of that monsoon extent increasing. You'll note I've also included two colours of shading around the central estimates. So let's think a bit more about the errors. So we want to know how much confidence to have in the reconstructed values. So ideally we want a comprehensive error model and that should represent the uncertainties in the individual proxy records. It should represent the uncertainties in calibrating the reconstruction. We should also think about structural uncertainties, such as whether our results are sensitive to the criteria used to select the proxy records or to our choice of statistical calibration method. And I should say that uncorrelated or random errors are much less of a problem because they reduce more easily with spatial and temporal averaging. It's the systematic and correlated errors which are harder to deal with. So we're going to take another trip from UEA, this time to northern Siberia, to look at some um, something from the Yamal Peninsula, which is at the north end of the Ural Mountains. There is only just warm enough in summer for trees to grow. So tree growth is limited and sensitive to summer temperature. So our colleagues Rashid Hantemirov and his and other Russian scientists have sampled many living and preserved dead larch trees here, which hopefully you can just about make out in the Google Earth picture, these little mounds of vegetation of the individual trees. And it's a region with quite rapid temperature change, which is driving the establishment of trees further north, as you can see in these four in these photos that are about four decades apart from Valerie and Mazipa. Hopefully that comes through online quite well. You can see the trees in the lower picture larger and more established compared to in the 1960s. So similarly to before, we use correlation and linear regression to evaluate and reconstruct climate uh, from, in this case, almost 800 living and subfossil Siberian larch trees, as I said, sampled by Rashid Antimirov and his colleagues over, over a period of 40 years of fieldwork. Um, the correlation with June to July temperature is 0.7. So again, we're using instrumental data to evaluate that from a nearby weather station. We can see at the top the last 1,000 years, at the bottom the full 2,000 years that we published in this paper by Griff Rotel 2013. Uh, and you know, it puts the modern warming in context of the previous variations, you know, compared to say the warm period around 250 AD, uh, which hopefully you can see here. Uh, or the cold, cold spell around 1450 shows up very strongly as well. And the uncertainty estimates. So again, I've used two shading here. We've got the blue component, which is the proxy uncertainty, which is based on the level of agreement between the individual tree samples and the number of samples we have. And then the calibration uncertainty is in pink. So the proxy uncertainty tends to be relatively more important for getting the longer term changes right. That's why it shows up more for the 100 year smooth data in the bottom panel compared to the shorter time scales on the top. So the last section is um, about the fact that things get more complex when we want to look beyond a single location. So my first two examples were one location, but of course we're interested in the large spatial scales as well. And for that we can use networks of proxy records 
Um, and the question then is, how do we combine and calibrate those? There's actually many approaches possible, not just those listed here, which are just a few examples. Um, we might simply take spatial averages, possibly weighted averages, um, of both the proxies and of the instrumental data to get a single time series of each representing a large spatial area and simply regress one series against the other. Um, or we can use the spatial patterns, reconstruct spatial patterns of climate and make use of spatial structures that are apparent in the proxy data. Sometimes the spatial patterns are in the instrumental data as well. Uh, or the third example at the bottom here is where we might use the spatial patterns simulated by climate models, for example, in the last millennium reanalysis. Um, and there, the um, those patterns of variability from climate models are, are weighted to kind of minimize the differences between the observed proxy values and the and the spatial patterns from the model in each year. So I'm going to give an example of the first, the simpler approach first. Um, so here again is using tree ring data, but now it's a network of tree ring data. 54 tree ring series altogether uh, in a project called N-Trend, led by Rob Wilson and Kevin Antrokaitis. Um, and these are all from higher latitude or higher elevation sites where we expect that the tree growth, again, is going to be limited by how warm the summers are. The best performing records here are those based upon the density of the wood rather than the ring widths. Um, and we average those records and separately average instrumental temperatures from all land north of 40 degrees latitude and then calibrate one against the other. <clears throat> So here is in the top two panels, you can see the calibration period shown above, both smooth on the right and unsmooth on the left. Uh, you could recall Phil Jones's comments earlier about the possible warm biases in the early instrumental summer temperatures, because that's what these are. Um, and then below is our large scale northern hemisphere extra tropical land summer temperature reconstruction. Bit of a mouthful there. Um, so again, that, that's what we've come up with. That's our uncertainty range as well, which encompasses some of those uncertainties I mentioned, but not all of them. Uh, and we could use this record, for example, to compare with the modern warming, taking into account those confidence intervals. Uh, or we could do other things. Uh, here, for example, we can use the unsmooth reconstruction to better understand how the climate responds to natural forcings. So here we can see that the northern hemisphere land clearly cools on average after explosive volcanic eruptions because this is a composite um, average over 11 such eruptions that took place over the last 1000 years uh, and they're all before averaging they've all been aligned so that year zero is the same as relative to the volcanic eruption in each case. Um, I'm going to finish I think I've got a few minutes to finish by returning to the latest IPCC assessment that was just published in August. So their assessment of global temperature change over the last 2000 years was based not only, but, but in large part on an excellent community initiative called Pages 2K. The first step was in assembling the database of proxy records that have good global geographical coverage and which are expected to be good indicators of temperature. We can see the proxy types listed here as well. They're not just tree rings. Um, also at the bottom, you can see the temporal coverage. So there's been a big expansion in tropical records with many corals, but they tend to only go back a few hundred years. In the first millennium, it's dominated by sediment records in brown and blue, uh, and in the um, second millennium by tree ring records, in terms of numbers at least. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, the Pages 2K group used this database to reconstruct global temperatures. First, they selected records that passed a screening for being sensitive to their local or regional instrumental temperatures. It's surprising to me that less than 40% of the records passed this because the original compilation had already aimed to include only temperature sensitive records. As I recall my earlier comment about it not being ideal to use the instrumental record twice, once to select the proxies and then again later to calibrate and evaluate the reconstruction. Uh, but it's not as bad as it seems because uh, they also showed that if they 
um, used all of the 692 records in the original compilation um, and omitted the screening step, uh, then they got a similar result. Uh, they then applied seven different statistical methods to go from that network of proxy data to estimate the changes in global mean temperature over the last 2000 years. So each of the seven methods are shown here by a colored line. Uh, in each case, they also um, explored the uncertainty um, further by generating an ensemble of thousands of, of possibilities shown by the gray shading. Um, you know, they varied the input data, uh, they varied some of the statistical parameters within their uncertainty ranges as well. So you can see a over, similar overall shape. You know, there's a downward trend over the first 1600 years. We can see the strong warming trend in the last 100 years. Um, the amplitude of the pre instrumental changes and some of the mean levels are sensitive to the statistical methods used to go from that network of 257 proxies to the global value. And two final slides to just kind of have a recap on, on this and think about some caveats. You know, how do we get to this image shown in the right hand, top right hand corner here? You know, first of all, nothing's possible without good quality proxy records in this case for temperatures. And it's been a real tremendous global effort to generate these records. And the instrumental record is used too for screening or selecting um, the proxies to use for weighting, them, calibrating them and so forth. Um, using it for both selection and calibration isn't ideal, um, but Pages 2K did consider that issue. So surprising to me how many records didn't pass the screening. Um, and, and the issues with this in terms of all the selection and the calibration is that if we've got few independent data points, it's always going to be harder to do and we're more likely to get um, less reliable results. So if the instrumental record is short uh, or if the proxy record is low resolution and it only has values, say, every decade, um, or if warming trends dominate, that's why, you know, it's a, it's a more powerful test if we can capture the detrended variability because uh, common trends could arise for other reasons. So uh, just to reiterate, the pages 2K did consider those issues. Um, some can't be so easily overcome, but we should therefore be a bit cautious still. Um, and finally, therefore, which uncertainties have they included? Well, it's a very good thing that they address many of the ones I mentioned before. I mentioned these four in particular, and they quantified the calibration uncertainties. Explore the structural uncertainties by using seven different statistical calibration methods. So that was good. Um, I think they've partially but not fully considered the limitations of underlying proxy records, um, both in terms of the uncertainties, or uncertainties on the individual records, but also the selection criteria. Um, and I think because of this, the assessment in the IPCC took an appropriate level of caution, uh, you know, in their use of language and level of confidence. So they said the last decade global temperature was more likely than not higher than any multi-century average during the Holocene. Um, and there's medium confidence that the rate of global warming during the last 50 years is unprecedented, at least the last 2000 years. So I think that's a good point to stop. Um, so thanks for listening and ready for questions. Hi, thank you, Tim. Yes, in interesting indeed. Very useful, very useful presentation. and. Uh... Yeah, covering something that's very, very important. Obviously, the longer um, period of data we've got, the, uh, the the better. And yes, you have some you have some questions. Um, Elizabeth Kent asks, um, is it hard to work out when the tree died? How do you know when a tree died? So the, the um, if it's an already dead sample, um, then yes, you can measure the ring widths and you get a, a time series of thin and thicker rings. And if you already have um, from other samples a record of tree growth in that area, then you can cross date one against the other. So in your new sample, you can um, try all the possible positions through time. Um, and if you find one that is massively a stronger fit to the existing data, then you know you've got the position right. Um, in some cases where there isn't existing data, for that time period and um, radiocarbon dating is used. Obviously, that's not as precise. OK, thank you. And Aisling um, 
asks about the, the data from southern Norway and Sweden. Um, why, wh why is it just the north? Why did you, do you not have data? Is there any particular reason for that? So I think for the temperature reconstruction parts, um, in fact, I guess that's what the question refers to. Um, it's about trying to get as near to the tree line as possible. So that the trees that are sampled are as, as limited by how warm the summers are as possible. Um, and therefore the, um, the correlation between the tree growth and the summer temperatures is as strong as possible. Uh, so that's part of the reason. But there are some, some series from southern Scandinavia which um, do have not as strong a correlation with temperature, but they do have some useful correlation with temperature. So some studies do use um, series from those regions too. OK, thank you. Anne. And um, Matthew Smith asks, uh, can you use the proxy data um, to expand uh, data sets for variability such as, I mean, mentioned, such as the uh, North Atlantic oscillations? Can you pick those up? Um, so, yes and no. Um, so people have certainly tried to reconstruct atmospheric circulation phenomena, like the North Atlantic Oscillation. I think the most reliable reconstructions um, are probably short ones that, that make use of early sea level pressure instrumental data, um, or um, what I haven't talked about here is the use of documentary records. Um, there have been some um, attempts to reconstruct from natural proxies. Um, but that's, you know, it's another level of, of indirect relationship because the proxy records are not measuring atmospheric circulation, uh, they're measuring temperature or precipitation. So you might find a record perhaps from North Scotland, um, a study by Valerie Truey and colleagues some years ago that used a record from North Scotland that was sensitive to precipitation there and from the Moroccan Atlas Mountains sensitive to precipitation there on the basis that when the North Atlantic Oscillation is in a particularly strong mode, then you get a contrasting precipitation signal in those two regions. Um, so that's, that's it's possible, but I think the uncertainties are larger because the relationship between um, the circulation and the local climate um, is not itself, um, you know, 100% cor correlation. There are other influences on rainfall in Scotland and Morocco than the North Atlantic Oscillation. So you have those other influences as well as the limitations of the proxy records themselves. Um, so yeah, it's possible, but but be even more cautious about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And finally, one uh, last question. Uh, Roy Thompson asks, um, it says 1850 to 1900 is not strictly pre-industrial, um, and that um, tree ring compilations suggest lower temperatures in the early 1800s. Does proxy data suggest that maybe 1850 to 1900 is the best? Is it the best period during instrumental record then to use? as a substitute for pre-industrial? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's various pieces of evidence that you can use to try and see what the true pre-industrial level might have been compared to 1850 to 1900. You know, Roy's quite right that the, there's already been some emissions of um, from human activity of, of carbon dioxide and some other radiatively important gases as well. So we don't necessarily expect that there have been no climate change uh, already taking place by then. Um, so these reconstructions can be used. Um, so typically about a, another tenth of a degree um, is what many of them show from, say, 1750 through to the later, latter half of the 19th century. Um, I'd say that, that some of the reconstructions, although they can be used for this, um, often the purpose is to try and get back as far as possible. Um, so some shorter records that could make the reconstructions even better um, may not be used because they're not a thousand years long. <laughs> so obviously for that particular question, you'll be quite happy to go back, say, to 1750. You don't need to go back to 1000 AD. Um, so yeah, there's to build a reconstruction that specifically answers that question, um, you might make a different choice of which data to use. Okay, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Fine. Um, Max Barron asks a question which as it says, it's slightly off topic, but it's an interesting one. Um, temperature sensitivity 
um, width density implies increasing carbon uptake. So any figures on how much of a multiply this might, this might have? I guess ultimately that's what you are actually measuring. You're measuring the carbon uptake in the tree. That's what affects the, the that's what growth effectively is. Yes, yes. It's, it's more complex, I guess, because where the carbon is allocated to can also change, whether it's allocated to, to increasing the root mass and making the trees less susceptible to droughts, whether it's actually adding diameter to the trunk, um, increasing the foliage in the crown and things like that. Uh, the, a bigger crown also needs a bigger trunk for a kind of mechanical or structural reasons too. So um, yes, but I would have the caveat that these trees that are typically used for the reconstructions um, are not necessarily typical of your forest as a whole because they are mostly sampled at the edges of the ecological range. Um, so the changes within the interiors of forests um, may be much less influenced by that. And of course, as well as climate, we then have to consider the, the fact that the CO2 levels in the atmosphere themselves um, can increase vegetation and tree growth so-called CO2 fertilisation effect as well. Um, and so that's another reason why carbon uptake can increase uh, in the in the terrestrial biomass. Um, and in fact, that's probably the bigger reason in many of the kind of, if you do an inventory of, an, of entire forested areas, that's probably a, a, a bigger and more important reason than the changes at the edges of the forested areas. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Well, that's the end of our the, the last speak, the last um, presentation. Um, it um, remains for me to thank all our all our speakers. Um, they've been uh, it's been a fascinating collect collection. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, the question to be answered: How exactly do we know climate change is climate is changing and by how much? Um, I think we've had. Uh, five sets of very interesting, very useful answers to answers to that. Thanks also to the um, RMS staff, uh, Catherine Bicknell in particular, um, who've done who did a great job in making this um, make, making this meeting work uh, smooth smoothly as it has. Uh, very good, and thank you everybody for um, coming along and um, and uh, listening. I, I hope you've all. Um, I hope you all gain from it as, as much as I have. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your days.